I've gone into the police station with my dad and I remember as I'm like, I didn't even get to sign the papers. As I've checked in with my name, the clerk guy's gone off. A group of officers have come over. They pulled out handcuffs and they said, we are arresting you. No, we are charging you with murder. Traffic and then um, the main guy, he literally said, I was in my car, I was in still traffic. I saw a boy running. He was being chased by three other boys who were like, just quite, just fairly a bit behind him. I noticed the boy at the front of the three had a knife in his hand. And he basically said, I saw the boy lunge forward and stab the boy that was being chased in his back. Um, in court, I found out he was stabbed uh, just under his left shoulder and it, it punctured a pulmonary vein. And like, um, yeah, like that's like severe blood loss. If you cut one of those veins, it's, it's like you lose a lot of blood. I just heard a commotion outside. I remember stepping back out of the cell. I see one of my friends with a snooker cue and he's chasing another guy from Birmingham. But this Birmingham guy has got like a sock in his hand and in the sock is like something large. But my friend with a sneaky is chasing him. As soon as this has happened, I remember it's all just kicked off. I've had like a plug in my hand. I've swung a plug. These guys, these Birmingham guys, they've all had knives. They're like swinging knives at us and then it's all spilled out onto the landing. I remember kicking someone, falling backwards and then literally like pool balls are going everywhere. So as this is all kicking off on association, prisoners are just running for their lives there's pool balls flying everywhere um literally like we've chased this Birmingham group they've started running again we've chased them one guy's tripped up one of my guys have like kicked him my guy with a pool cue still chasing the guy it's just kicking off in different directions but i remember literally just running running trying to fight these guys but they're running there's pool balls flying everywhere and like for that moment i just felt like superman i remember like there were pool balls flying towards me and i managed to just dodge every single shot like it was like pool balls there was like broken glass flying and I remember just dodging everything even kettles were being thrown and I remember just dodging kettles and literally these guys retreated to the second floor and we were on the first floor now and then um it's crazy because this is a bit similar to like the case and um they were basically telling us to come upstairs we're telling them to come downstairs while all this is going on the officers are just locking everyone up everyone behind your door everyone behind your door everyone behind your door everyone's being locked up behind their doors um the bell's been pressed all the wings in the prison have been locked away because it's like general alarm number three all the officers emergency assistants all the officers in the prison have come to our wing and these guys from birmingham are still on the second floor they've got kettles they've got blades and like they're basically telling us come upstairs and we're saying come downstairs and nobody's listening the officers have got a, um, a megaphone they're at the gate and they're telling us last chance come back to the wing so we've got an absolute fantastic story today. I mean, it's a dark place he goes to, but it's inspirational how he comes out at the end. And I'm here with Cliche. Huge thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. We've been talking for ages to coordinate this, and there's not many people who can tell stories in such detail and just take you on that gripping journey I was mesmerised listening to... Might have been the Blue Tick. Blue Tick, Blue Tick. shout out to Blue Tick. Michael yeah. Mellon, yeah. He's doing great and I'm, I'm watching him a lot. <laughs> Probably watching him more than most uh, great guests. So, Cliché was wrongfully convicted of murder and sentenced to life, mm -hmm. but he was involved with gangs and stuff mm -hmm. and we're going to get to all that. It's quite a detailed story to set up. Mm -hmm. And Cliché's links are in the description box. We've got your Instagram down there. Yeah, TikTok, YouTube. And your YouTube, yep. whatever you send us, we'll put down there. So let, let's let start then with what led up to the offence. Mm -hmm. who, who, what kind of people were you? Actually, um, so around this time I was 15. Um, this dates back to 2010. Um, <clears throat> I was actually still in year 11 at this time. And um, I think by this time, 2010, um, I was... I wouldn't say I was like a gang member, but I was definitely affiliated. Um, I had a mate, a friend who was a gang member and, um, you know, associating with him over time, I got to know other people through through my friend who were gang members. And um, I think it started off as like, just being known to a few people. Then eventually I've got a few numbers. They've got my number and there'll be like regular meetups and things like that. So yeah, at this point, I'd say I was quite involved with like gangs. Just to expand mm -hmm. on that for American audience then, because in America, like 
the gang's jumped you in mm -hmm. and you've got a position or you're doing this or that. Mm -hmm. I imagine it's a lot different in London. Yeah, in London. Um, I feel like with America, there's more, there's more of an initi initiation, if that makes sense. Um, for me, I just feel like there were a few incidents I'd, I'd gone along to, a few occasions, a few fights where I kind of showed, um, I showed some courage. Um, I didn't run away. Um, and I think people just, that was my kind of way in, like, look, this guy, like, you know, he's not a street kid, he's not a gangster, but like, he's just as brave as us and, like, he's always there for support and we can rely on him to come and, like, back us if, if needed. So I think that was my kind of ticket in, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And in America, the gangs, it's very racially divided. Yeah. So how does that work in London? Um, in London, I wouldn't really say the gangs are racially divided, but a lot of the gangs are kind of formed within like the black communities. Like there are other gangs, there are white gangs, there are Albanian gangs, but I feel like where the black where the black gangs in London, they kind of adopt the the American kind of style of gang. So they would have like colours, uh postcodes in America they they like they rep sixty third street or fifty fourth street. So in London it's more like postcode and we do colours and like Rap, rap's a big influence in gang culture, yeah. So I think London gangs kind of mirror American gangs, yeah. So a postcode, if you're in America, is a zip code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you're a young person, you're a teenager. Mm -hmm. You've shown heart, bravery. Mm -hmm. You're getting accepted by the gang. Mm -hmm. How are you progressing? Um. So I think at the time, I'd started off maybe just hanging around with a few people. Um. Just it's literally just hanging in London. There's a lot of uh, it's like almost like patrolling. So if you're from an area, a group of you might you know you're just patrolling, just in your area. There's nothing to do, but you know you're either looking out for other people that might cause a threat to the area. Um, opportunities may arise. There might be people to rob. You know there might be drug dealers to rob. Things like that. So it started off as hanging around. Then I'm being called for like fights. Um, you know, I might get involved in like some robberies, things like that. Um, even like just chasing other people off. So people from other territories might come in and like, they're not coming in to show any sort of threat or violence, but it's just the fact that you're not from here and we have a reputation to hold. So we will like make sure they run off back to the area and get out. So just little things like that, I think. And then just slowly over time, I kind of find myself mainly around the gang, yeah. So have you got any stories from patrolling? Patrolling, yeah, I've got, I've got um, there's a Halloween incident I always talk about. Um, basically, I think like it was Halloween, this was 2009. This was still the early days of me just being a bystander. Not a bystander, but just kind of just being associated. Um, I think, uh, I'd say about 15 of us, we'd all meet up. Um, and basically like we had issues with another area. So about 15 of us had met up. Um, and on the way to this specific area we had issues with, I think we met up with about another five more guys. And um, so all together there was about 20. And we were basically just patrolling this other area, looking for like uh, gang members from that area. And literally we would just be walking around for hours. Uh, where it was Halloween, I think like a lot of kids are out trick or treating, costumes and masks. So it wasn't weird that people were in costume, well, masks covering the face. Um, and yeah, the incident, so there was about 20 of us and basically I think we saw about a group of 10 boys. Uh, we weren't really sure who they were. Um, they looked quite bigger than us, but um, I remember we just ran towards them and they didn't run. So this was like my first incident I could say where um, I wasn't sure how things would end up. They didn't run, but at the same time we didn't back down. We got towards them with head-on collision and we just had a big fight. We ended up beating them up. Um, I remember the main guy on his bike, he had a chain. His chain was taken, um, and uh, I think at the time I was um, I wasn't I didn't have strength, but I was throwing my little punches what I could. I did what I could, and when other people saw that, they were like, "Yeah, this kid." Because a few guys that were in the gang didn't even they didn't even get involved. They were a bit shocked. So I think that was the first incident where people said, "Yeah, this kid like he, he can roll with us. He can come with us." Yeah. How does that feel to be in a battle? The adrenaline's going, is it? Was yeah, exciting. It was, I'll be honest with you, it was scary, but I think it's that peer pressure of not showing fear. So I just felt like I'm just going to see it through to the end. If I get beat up, I get beaten up. Um, 
you know, I didn't think it was going to be any more than a fight. And it wasn't any more than a fight. It was just literally just fists and kicking. And um, yeah, that was my first, I'd say, incident, 2009, Halloween. And I felt like, yeah, I can, like, I can, this is a life I can, I can do, I can do this. Yeah. What was the next incident? Next incident? Um, There's was, there was a few more. There was just ones where basically, like, we would see other members of gangs. Um, We might not specifically have issues with them, um, but, like, let's say they were coming through our area on bikes or just walking through. We would just rob them. And um, I think the main reason we, we did things like this was so those gang members would go back to their area and they'll be telling people, oh, we went we went here and we got robbed. So it's almost like we're boosting our rep and we're kind of like, we're almost trying to make our area quite like notorious to like for other people not to come here, if that makes sense. That's yeah. what I was going to ask. So mm -hmm. wouldn't they know better than to come in your area? Don't they know they're going to get robbed? Um, well, mm, there is a possibility they will get robbed, but... It's a thing of they didn't have issues with our area. So I felt like they thought maybe we can just go through it. I don't know. I don't know where they were going, but we were trying to like, we were trying to get the name up in our area. We live in a small kind of area of Lewisham called Grove Park. And I think we just wanted to boost the reputation. So we were just letting people know, you know, if gang members come here or if guys that think they're gang members come here, you're going to get robbed. You're going to get chased out. You're going to get beaten up, things like that. So who's your neighbouring areas? Who's your rivals? Um, so we had issues with an area called Catford. Um, which is in, so I'm from Lewisham Borough. The specific area I was from was a place called Grove Park. Um, we had issues with an area called Catford, um, a place called Deptford, um, Deptford, Deptford and Sydenham. Yeah, so those were three other areas within the borough. And the Lewisham Borough itself has about nine areas in it. And um, to be honest, the whole of Lewisham as a borough, I think all the areas, they don't really get on, but those three areas were like, like direct issues we had with there. So did you ever go in the areas? Yeah, yeah, we used to go in the areas. Sometimes we would go, if we were bored, sounds silly, but if we were bored and had nothing to do, we just thought, you know, should we just like, it was just like an adrenaline <laughs> rush. We just like, we'll just get on bikes, get on a bus and we'll just go there and just, if we see anyone, just try to beat them up or we'll kind of be patrolling it to see people. And it's almost like it was the thrill of, you know, anything could happen and, at the same time, we knew we were kind of like boosting our reputations like individually. So yeah, those are things we kind of took part in. So how did this get heavier then that led towards the offence? The offence. So the offence actually took place 2010 on the 5th of May. Um, and it was, it was just a normal day for me. I literally went to school. Um, I got on the train to school. My school was quite... So my school wasn't actually in London. It was in a place called Kent, uh, which is like another part of, it's like beside, it's another county, it's beside London. But um, yeah, I literally got the train to school. It was a normal day. And um, I remember after school, I got a phone call with my friend. Um, and he, he he sounded quite like, sounded quite distressed, sounded distressed, sounded a bit angry. And I remember he was just telling me um, that basically he'd been confronted by two boys at his school. Um, these two boys were from one of those areas that we had issues with. Um, and obviously my friend that's ringing me, his school is in Lewisham. My school is out of Lewisham, out of London. So as he's rang me, he's explaining to me, these two boys have come to his school um, and they basically like kind of belittled him at the school gates. Um, as you can imagine, when school's over at 3 p.m., everybody's coming out, like everyone, all years, sixth form teachers. So with these two boys in their own clothes, they've approached my friend um, and they've kind of like tried to size up towards them, trying to size up to them and belittle them. Um, I can't remember the exact words that were, were used, but they were basically trying to like belittle them in front of everyone, just embarrass them. So yeah, my friends rang me and he said, this has happened. And um, and it, immediately I felt pissed. I felt angry. I felt like, oh, who are these guys? Especially because they're from the other area that we don't, get, we don't get along with. So my friend was just like, yeah, I feel like we need to go back. We need to go do something. And then I was like, yeah, that's fine. That's cool. And I was like, I was, I, I wanted to like have a fight with those guys as well myself. So I've got the phone call. The phone call's finished. I've left school. I've headed to back to London now, back to Lewisham where I'm from. And um, I've met up with my friend that rang me. He's with another guy. So there's three of us. And uh, we're just, I'm just asking him what's happened. And he's like, nah, I can't, nah, I feel like a dickhead. Like I feel like a dickhead. This guy's took me for a dickhead. Um, and yeah, from there, we just kind of, we just kind of agreed that, yeah, we're going to go there. 
um, literally we're just going to go there. Like, we were still in our school uniform. Like, we hadn't gone home. We hadn't got changed. Um, I still had my bag with books in. And I just felt like, yeah, we just just go there because they didn't know we were coming. And if we just thought if we go there, like a surprise, you know, we might see one of them at the shops. We could just beat them up, whatever. Um, so there's three of us now. Another guy who was quite local to us, who used to hang around with us, he joined us, so now there's four of us. Um, I think a few phone calls were made. We were trying to round up a few more people because obviously we were only 15. We were quite young. Um, the two boys that approached my friend at the school, they were quite older. They were about 17, 18. So, you know, being 17, 18, you're quite, it's quite a, there's a significant difference in an 18 year old to a 15 year old. Even though it's three years, those three years, they, make up for height, maturity, voice, everything. So we just wanted to round up a few more guys so we could feel a bit more confident before entering the area. Um, we've made a few phone calls and uh, there was three more friends that we had who were, uh, they weren't in our area, but they were like towards the area we were heading to. So we just told them to meet us in the actual area that we're going to. We've got on a bus. Um, these are the days where uh, I think kids still have it. We have like Oyster cards that we tap on our bus um, these are like cards that like they they lead back to us. They have our face on it. They have our address. It's all registered online. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we've tapped it. We're on cameras. Like we've just signaled. Yeah, we're on a bus. We've gone to this area. Twenty minutes later, we've got off the bus. Our three friends that we're meeting up with, um, they're there. So now there's seven of us, and um, you know, like we're ready to go. I felt a bit more like confident now. Yeah, there's seven of us. Um, some of the guys that I was with as well, like I knew like they, they weren't soft guys. They were like, they could have it, they could fight. So I just felt like, yeah, like there's seven of us. This is this is enough. We can go, we can go do it. Um, I received a phone call before we actually like set out to go find these guys. And I received a phone call of um, these two younger kids who one was 13 and one was 14. And funny enough, when I first met up with my friend that rang me, uh, these these two little kids, they were local and they kind of overheard that we were going to go confront these boys. And um, I remember they wanted to come. They wanted to come along. You know, they were excited. Like, oh, let us come, let us come, let us roll. And I just remember thinking, you lot of kids, like, you lot, you lot aren't coming. Do you know what I mean? Like, they just wanted to, like, see some action. They wanted to be in the mix. They probably wanted to tell their friends at school, yeah, we went along. So we told them not to come. Fast forward half an hour. We've all got off at the area. I've got a phone call. They're saying, we're here, we're here, we're here. And I remember literally I was on the phone and I said, oh, they're, they're here. And then um, instead of telling them not to come, I feel like we were in a, a new area. We were confident there were seven of us, but we still were a bit skeptical, you know, cause these boys were older. Um, it could have gone any way really. So I think just to feel a bit more safer for numbers, we said, yeah, let them come. So they ended up meeting us. So now there's nine of us. Um, I'd say seven of us were there to have a fight. The two little kids, they're just, they're there for numbers. They don't look tough, but we might look a bit more intimidating with two more bodies. So now there's nine of us and literally same thing. We're just patrolling, patrolling. It's um it's May. I remember it was a hot day, sun was out. We were all in our school uniform. We're just walking around, patrolling, patrolling. There's a high road. It's like a main road. Um, We're at the bottom of it now. And I remember just looking down the main road so obviously there's a lot of cars in the roads. Uh, there's shops on the right side. The pavement side we were on is just, uh, it's, I didn't know at this point, but it leads to like a park on the left side. If you go up on the right side, the shop's going up. So we're walking, we're walking, still patrolling, just scanning, you know, see if we can see any like gang members. Um, how we would identify gang members is also quite funny because people might ask, how would you know who the gang member is? Um, it's still quite the same now, but there's like a specific dress code for a gang member in those days in South London. And um, it it mainly be like black clothing, black night clothing. Um, even though it was a hot day, people are wearing woolly hats. People are wearing, I don't know, like uh, there's like balaclavas, the ones with the holes in the mouth, the eyes. And if you roll them up, you can almost wear it as like a woolly hat. So even though it's a hot summer's day, that was the fashion, you know, wearing massive bomber jackets in the summer just to look, I don't know, just to look intimidating, look tough. So we spotted f uh, three three guys. I couldn't tell you how old they were, but they just fit this look. They literally fit the look, all black, 
One of them had the big night coat on and they were all had woolly hats on. So instantly when we saw them, we just like, something just told us, like, even if that wasn't those guys that confronted my friend, they were gonna get it because they're from here. So as soon as we saw them, uh, my group just started pelting towards them. We just started running. We just started charging towards them. So uh, This road was quite long, by the way. So as we started running, I think those three guys at the shops, they've like looked and they've seen, oh, wow, like, shit, there's a group running at us. I remember they ran across the road. So we're on the road of the pavement. They're on the other side, quite far ahead. They've ran across the road. So we're just running it up in a straight line. And where we've kind of got to the point that they ran to and they disappeared to, I remember I've hit like a, it's like a fence, um, like a metal fence. And I remember hitting, like getting to the fence. And I remember instantly, it was almost like I ran into a force field. I remember like my whole body just, just shocked, like stopped. I was like, whoa. And the reason this happened was because as I looked through the fence, I could see those three boys, they were running into the like a, a big park, a big field, they were running, but uh, ahead of them, was like a massive group. And um, we were with, there was nine of us in our group, but I just remember this group looked like two times of our group and they all looked like they were quite large. They were big, they were big guys. Um, so yeah, I just remember seeing this large group and I can't lie, that at that moment, my body just stopped. I just said, no, 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 no. Like, this, this is like, this doesn't look safe anymore. And my body just stopped. But some of my friends had already hopped over the fence. They were already running. And um, when I stopped, someone that was behind me pushed past me. He'd hopped over the fence. And I remember he turned back and shouted, I come, man, come. So I just thought, I think that gave me the boost. Like, oh, fuck it, let's just go into this. So I've hopped over the fence myself. Bear in mind, there is a lot of guys in this park. But um, funny enough, as we've approached the park, as we've all approached the park and got into the park, the large group, they've now seen us. The large group turned their backs and started running. So that kind of that kind of made me feel a bit at ease. That kind of made me feel a bit great. I'm not gonna lie. The fact that they're running means like we're winning right now. So I kind of started running a bit faster. Like at the time I was running, I wasn't running as fast as I could. I didn't, I, I was I was a bit hesitant. But now I'm seeing them run. I thought, yeah, cool. Let's go. We're chasing them. We're chasing them. And it was an amazing feeling because. You know, like I say, there's only like seven of us, main, the main guys in our group, there's seven of us. We're chasing after this large group of bigger, older kids and they're literally fleeing. And it was just an amazing feeling because I felt like I was so pissed off with the fact that they confronted my friend at school and now we're in their area making them sh like run, run. So it was an amazing feeling. We're running, this park by the way, is 200 meters long. As we're chasing these guys head on, head on, we're chasing them through. I remember just seeing um, objects like kind of, some were dropping, some were like in the air. And as I'm running towards, as I'm running, chasing the guys, I remember I'm seeing what these objects were as I'm getting closer. And I recognized one of them, one of the items, and it was a knife. So as I've seen the knife, my brain kind of was a bit like, whoa, they've got knives. But at the same time, the threat was kind of like, the threat was getting further away from me, if that makes sense. They were running away. And um, when I did see the knife, I kind of, I did, um, I was a bit hesitant to keep chasing them, but they were running so fast. They had such a head start. Like, I just knew, like, by the time we got to the end, they'd be, they'd be gone. So, um, yeah, so I saw a knife. I've carried on running. I see another knife. I didn't see the knife get thrown, but I just seen it, like, sticking out in the grass. And then I just started to think, wow, like these guys were armed. These guys were armed. But um, we've ran to the end of the park now, literally ran to the end and they've left the park and like they've ran down a road. And I remember coming back into the park and just feeling a, feeling a sense of relief. I'm looking around, all my friends are like shaking hands, jumping, like, yes, like we've chased them out. Do you know what I mean? Like we're satisfied. They came to the school, embarrassed my friend. Um, we've gone to their area, we've chased them off. Like we're satisfied, we feel great. I think we were talking amongst ourselves for like five minutes, just making jokes, literally just taking a piss, laughing at them. And um, yeah, we started to leave the park. So we're at the top end now and the park's 200 meters long. So slowly, slowly, we're not running anymore. We're just walking because, you know, we've won the, the battle. We've won the little, whatever you want to call it. Um, we're leaving. So we're walking, we're walking down. I'd say when we got about halfway through the park, about 100 meters in, um, I heard like a, a large, 
it was just I just heard a deep voice. It was like a large shout. Um, he said "pussios." I literally remember he shouted like "pussios," and I just remember thinking, "What?" Like, what the? So we've all turned. I remember we all just all turned around, and when we turned around, those guys that were there that we chased off the first time, they'd come back. I'd say about half of that group came back, but they weren't. Like this time, they just looked like they were ready. Like they looked like. They looked like they were ready for war. I can't lie to you. Like they were literally all spread out in a line. Um, I could see knives this time. Like this time I could see knives in hands. I could see knives. I could see swords. I could see uh, like long, long objects of wood. I, can't, I couldn't say if it was a table leg or some sort of broom, but I could see sticks. Um, I even saw a hammer. So I'd say about first time when they all ran off, there was a large group. I'd say about nine or 10, eight to 10 came back this time. But this time they were like ready. When I say ready, they 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 weren't scared this time. They came back, they were ready for war. Um, and I just remember thinking, wow, like it went from chasing people, running them down, laughing at them, to literally just being like confronted by a group that were ready for war, whatever you want to call it. And um, the guy that shouted pussyos, I could instantly tell that like, he was like the leader of this group because he was like at the front. He was the tallest guy. He looked quite like he had size on him, quite big. And I was just thinking, wow, like I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I didn't know what to do, but I just felt like, what's everyone else gonna do? Like I didn't want to show fear. I didn't want to run away. I didn't want to be known as the kid that you know when it got when it got too hot in the kitchen, he left. So I just felt like I'm just gonna see where this goes. But anyway, the guy that shouted pussyos, um, he started stepping forward and he started shouting things like, you lot come here, like you lot think you can come here. Like he was just like literally just shouting loads of things at us. And I remember looking at my friends that I'm with and like there was, there was a lot of hesitance, I'll be honest, amongst our group. Everyone was a bit like, well, wow, like it's gonna be, it's gonna be left. And um, I remember the guy that was doing the shouting I noticed he had a samurai sword in his hand. Um, the samurai sword was quite, it was, it was lengthy. It was like, it wasn't hitting the floor, but he had it holding, he'd had his hand holding it down. It wasn't hitting the floor, but it was long. And um, at the time I thought he had two, but I found out later on that he had a sheath. So the sheath is what you put the sword in and you pull it out. But he had the sheath in his hand as if it was another sword. So yeah, now we've been confronted, you know, we've, we chased them off, but they've come back. The guy's shouting at us. He's telling us to come. We didn't want to come. Um, some guys in my group, though, are shouting, you lot come. They didn't want to come. I didn't really want them to come. I'll be honest with you. I didn't I didn't want them to come. It, I didn't want it to get to what it could have got to. Do you know what I mean? And then um, instantly in this moment, I remembered uh, the knives that were discarded by the group earlier. So I remember running back, backwards a bit, not too far but it wasn't too far I could see it because it was such a sunny day these knives they were just on just balanced on grass so I remember I picked up one of these knives and I had it in my hand and like instantly when I had the knife I don't know I just I felt a lot safer I felt like yeah like you know I've got something now like I know the guy's got a sword but I just felt like look I've got something I've got something to protect myself I felt a lot better but um, I remember as well when I picked up the knife the main guy with the sword he saw me pick up the knife and he actually like pointed me out and said see you <laughs> I'm gonna cut you and then when he said that I remember just feeling like oh why me why me why me like why not him like why me I remember thinking why me man like but he saw me and then that made me kind of think oh like I just had to just keep this face on I just had to keep this I'm not scared like, I'm, I'm here you know no one else is running I think everyone was scared but no one was showing they're scared it's the, like the peer pressure in it like amongst boys so there was a lot of back and forth in now. There's a lot of shouting. Um, guys from my group are saying, come. Even I'm saying come, but deep down, I don't want them to come. They're saying come. I say this back and forth in was going on for a good flag, like, five minutes. But as you can imagine, five minutes of shouting is a very long time. It's a very long time. And um, as all this is going on, by the way, um, I hadn't noticed at this point, but the park that happened in was in this like, slap bang in the middle of this area. Um, there were like tower blocks, like social housing, council housing, uh, in the direction that those guys were standing in. 
um, these tower blocks, they go up quite high. And like by now, where there's been a large commotion, a lot of people running around with weapons and shouting, uh, a lot of people were literally just at their windows, like heads out of windows, on the phone to the police, just watching everything as it's unfolding. Um, and eventually after this back and forth of shouting, you guys come, no, you guys come. Uh, someone from my group, I remember he had like, I think it was a plank or a table leg. It was some something wooden. And I remember he just, he kind of gave us this energy boost. He kind of gave us the the rush that we needed. And I remember he shouted, you man, fuck it, like, fuck it. He literally said, fuck it. And just started running towards this lad, this group on his own. And like immediately, as soon as he started running, everyone started following suit. Me, myself as well, me included. So we all just started running towards this group. Uh, bear in mind, I've still got this knife in my hand, by the way. So we started running towards this group. And um, luckily, once again, the group started running, which was a relief because I'm just doing what I'm doing to look like I'm not scared. I didn't want these guys to stand there and run at us. I didn't want them to, to engage with us. I wanted them away. But I almost felt like the scarier we can look, the more intimidating we look, we can scare these guys off. So we're running towards this large group now. Um, a lot of people are running in different directions, uh, but they're all mainly exiting the park. There was one specific guy I remember seeing. Uh, he ran, he didn't run towards us. Well, it seemed like he was running towards us, but then he kind of turned left. He turned left and he kind of went out of vision. But I'm mainly focusing on like the main threat, the guy with the swords, and he's running. So I didn't want him to ever turn around and run at us. So we just carried on making sure that these guys were going. We've chased them off, chased them out of the park. I've I've run out of the park myself to the road, and I remember looking down the road, looking down at them, and I could see like that group literally just running off. Some of them still had knives on them. They were running off. And I remember just like the adrenaline, I remember shouting like, like you dickheads. You lot of pussyos, like you lot of ran. And I remember feeling once again that sense of relief because I didn't want this to happen, but I didn't want to look soft to my group. And I also didn't want to like be harmed by this group. So it was a relief. Second time round, they ran. This time, I was not trying to stand and talk and celebrate whatever. I just wanted to leave now. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, those guys have run off. Um, I've come back into the park. So my group, there was nine of us. I don't really class those two kids as the nine because they were just spectators, but there's a group of seven. I've come back into the park now and I remember looking at my group and I felt like, why does my group look small? Why does like, where's the seven gone? Do you know what I mean? Um, and I could see people in like different parts of the park. I could say like in my vision, I probably saw about three guys. Like, so I'm there and there's three more. And I was thinking, like, where is everyone gone? And um, as I'm just kind of scanning the park. Hey, do you know what that sound means? Ooh, that's something I've been hearing a lot lately. I can't help but love that. That's what I hear when I make another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. The Pokemon business I've recently started with someone is absolutely thriving thanks to Shopify. Shopify accepts all kinds of payments and sometimes it's complex when you get on a platform but their dashboard makes it completely simple. Covering all your sales channels from a shop front ready POS system to its all in one e commerce platform. Shopify even gets you selling across social media marketplaces like Facebook, Insta, TikTok, and YouTube. Full of the industry leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without learning new skills in design or coding. And thanks to award winning help, and with an extensive business course library, Shopify is ready to support your success every step of the way. So when it comes to dealing with people all over the world, Shopify is absolutely enabling us to smash it with our Pokemon business. Before Shopify, our Pokemon card business was in the dark ages. It's time to get serious about selling and get Shopify today. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.co.uk slash Sean. Link in description box below this video on YouTube. Thanks for watching. 
back to the podcast. Talk. I'm seeing everyone kind of like heading back to the direction that we came in. So everyone's kind of leaving. And because I've chased these guys to the end of the park and out the park, I'm basically one of the last guys in the park and I did not want to be left in the park. So I've started running towards the way we come in now. Um, so the park's 200 metres long. Oh yeah, I've still got the knife in my hand. So I was on autopilot. Um, I didn't think to drop the knife. I didn't think to throw the knife. I just think when I first initially picked it up, it just gave me a sense of like, at least I've got something now because those guys have got swords, those guys have got weapons, those guys have got knives. So at this point, yeah, I didn't even, I just still had the knife. I didn't even realise I had the knife, but I still had the knife. I've left the park. I've come out the park. I've come out the way we came in, the same road. And when I've left the park, I remember, uh, I just remember seeing that road that I was talking about of a lot of cars, other side, a lot of shops. I remember coming out the park and literally every single shop that was on that road, I think was everyone inside those shops had come out now um, from barber shops to hair salons, to off licenses, to laundrettes. Every single person had come out their shop to watch this whole thing just kick off, unfold from the very start. I even saw guys with like a, you know, guys with mid haircut with the, the barber thingy around their neck, but they're out and they're just watching. Um, because it's 2010, there, there is no iPhone and smartphone. If this was today, people all have their phones filming. But everyone's just watching, thinking, what is going on? And I remember looking over, thinking, wow, like, this is mad. Like, everyone's looking at me now. I didn't even register. I still had the knife as well. Everyone's looking at me. I felt like, wow. As I've looked down the, the roads that we came up from, I could see all my friends. Now I could see all seven of my friends, but they're all in different parts of the roads. Some are, like, right at the end. Some are a bit further ahead. Some are a bit closer to me. And um, as I started jogging towards my friends on the pavement, I remember seeing that first boy that I told you guys about who had ran in our direction, but he like did like a left turn. And I remember seeing him, but his figure was uh, inside a shop. It was uh, behind a door, like a glass door of a chicken shop. Um, and when I saw him, I didn't, nothing really, nothing, nothing registered. I didn't, he didn't seem like he'd been harmed. He didn't seem aggressive. He just looked like he was literally just barricading himself within the shop. Um, I could see he's like leaning onto the door for like, you know, just a bit of leverage in case someone was trying to get in. So I saw him. I think he saw me. And I literally just saw him and I just, just carried on like running like towards my friends, my group, carried on running to catch up to them. I was literally the second last guy to come out of this park. So... Technically, I'm closer to those guys than my friends, so I'm just trying to catch up. I'm trying to, I'm not. Trying, I don't want to be left behind. Um, I've got to the end of the road, and I remember everyone was like going in different directions. Some guys were like go this way, some guys will go that way, and this whole time, I still didn't realize I had the knife in my hand. So I've just ran past like a hundred witnesses, a hundred people in the street in broad daylight with this knife, and I didn't even realize I had the knife because I was just like, it, I just had it in my hand. Um, and at this point, I remember I heard sirens, like I heard a lot of sirens. They sounded like they were f quite far, um, but I could just tell it was multiple sirens. And literally, I just, I just, I just remember thinking, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I've got the knife, shit. And um, I remember literally there was a bus stop um, behind it. it, was like a construction site. And I remember just in panic, I remember I threw the knife. And I remember as I threw the knife, I saw a load of people's heads follow the knife in the air. And just, oh, watch the knife just got bang. And like, I just, I just didn't want the knife in my hand. And I just thought, wow, get the knife gone. I've thrown the knife. Everyone's gone in different directions. So my actual main friend um, that I told you guys about that kind of how I got involved in this gang life, in the street life, my main friend, he said to me, let's go this way. Cause all these guys are going in this group let's just go this way. So we've gone a separate way and we're walking up a road now. And as we're walking up this road, those sirens are getting louder and louder and louder. And they got to a point where I could now see these cars. Um, these were vans, we call them bully vans. These like, they're not police cars, they're police vans. They have like, um, they have like, sh uh, not, I wouldn't say shields, but it's for, it's for riots, you know, like on the windscreen, they've got metal cages on in case people throw bricks during like riots or whatever. And there's about six of these vans and they're coming at high speed. 
but they're coming down the road I assume they're going to the park where all this confrontation just kicked off so they're coming down the road now and my heart is pounding because obviously I was just there um, but I assume they're looking for like a large group of boys fighting with weapons by now I'm just with my one friend there's two of us and we're just walking and like I told you I'm in school uniform you know I'm not in a balaclava I'm not in dark clothing I'm not in anything that looks criminal if that makes I'm just literally in my school uniform so they've drove past us all six cars vans they've drove past us and that was a relief I thought whew, like you know they've gone past and as we're walking um, obviously cars are going past in the road me and my friend are walking we're not really talking because I think I'm still kind of getting to grips with the fact that you know, these guys had swords man like like yeah we left unharmed we left you know we didn't get stabbed but I think I'm still kind of just like it's it's the calm down now and I'm thinking wow that was cra- that was crazy and um I remember when we were walking I could hear like banging it was like banging on a glass window like banging but it was a bus so as we hear boom 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 I've turned with my friend and I could see my friends that I'd come to this area with initially they were all sat at the back of the bus and they were literally banging the window and they were like come 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 on the bus so where they all split up just a bit earlier, they'd actually gone to a bus garage. Uh, the bus garage is basically like the first stop of the bus route. So they've got on the bus where everyone gets on the bus at the bus station. So obviously they've all sat at, um, as a group at the back of this bus. By the time the bus has come to us, because it's done about two different bus stops, um, the bus was quite full. So when I've got on the bus, um, we would have sat with them at the back, but the bus was like full. Um, so me and my friend, we literally had to sit, uh, stand at the front, kind of beside the bus driver where the bus was so packed. And um, the bus, a uh, 20 minute journey. So 20 minutes of just literally just stood there and like standing there in silence, like, wow, like just standing there thinking, shit, this is crazy. I remember even looking around the bus, I'm seeing like women, I'm seeing kids, I'm seeing men. And I'm almost thinking like, these guys don't even know like what the hell just happened. Like and I was thinking, these guys don't even know what just, what could have happened. And um, the bus has arrived now back at our area, Grove Park. We've got off the bus. And as we've got off the bus, um, obviously everyone's getting off, a lot of people are getting off. My group of friends that we went there with, they're all coming off the bus too. Everyone's going in different directions. No one's really saying, let's go chicken shop or let's go here or let's go chicken. Everyone's literally just in their own world going in different directions. I can't remember the guy. I can't remember which guy it was. One of the guys in my group literally said, yo, my man got touched. Um, touched is like a, it's like a slang word. Um, it just means harmed. So touched can mean anything. Touched can mean he got punched. Touched can mean he got stabbed. It just means some sort of like, yo, my man got touched. So when he said my man, I'm thinking who? I didn't know who. I wasn't sure if it was someone from my group. I wasn't sure if it was someone from their group, but... It didn't look like anyone from my group had been harmed. Everyone looked okay. But I just remember hearing my man got touched and everyone's kind of scattered off in different directions. So I just went home as well. My friend who I walked off with, he lives quite near to me. So we've gone our way and we've gone home. And um, it sounds a bit weird, sounds a bit crazy, but I went home as if nothing had happened, as in gone home, got changed, was at home, my mum was at home. And I, I used to play Call of Duty on the Xbox. So I've gone on Call of Duty, gone on the parties, I'm just playing. And I remember like a few hours later, uh, I got a phone call off one of my friends. Uh, I've picked up the phone and he's told me, go on, uh, he's like, he said, go on BBC News, go on BBC News right now. And um, I'm, I'm on the Xbox, I'm on live. So I'm mid game, I'm playing with Americans and stuff. I'm, I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, go on BBC News right now, right now, man. And I just felt like, the way he said it, I could hear some sort of like, I could hear something in his voice. Like he sounded, he sounded very like disturbed, sounded scared. So then I just thought, oh, you know what? I've changed it from AV, I've gone to channel one. And I remember like, it literally just said uh, a murder happened this evening and I could see that chicken shop and I could see a lot of police tape outside it. And then it took a few seconds to register, but I was like, that's that's the spot. That's where we was. That's where we was. And then my and and as I'm as I'm registering it, my friend's like, "Yo, he died. He died." I'm saying, "Who?" He's like, "My man, my man. He died. He got stabbed." 
And I was thinking, what is he talking about? And then like, um, it just said a 16 year old had been stabbed and he'd been pronounced dead at the scene. So in my head, I'm thinking, what is he talking about? And then um, I remember, uh, so he's hung up. And then I think uh, I rang someone else. I rang another one of my friends that were there, not the guy that done the murder. I rang another one of my friends and I said, yo, have you seen this? And he's like, yeah, my man died. And that's when I found out that um, that kid that I saw the first time when he ran towards us, but turned left. And then I saw him again when I'd exited the park in the chicken shop. I didn't know, but he'd already been stabbed by then. So he'd been stabbed and um, he'd, he'd fled into the chicken shop for like, for refuge, for his safety. And yeah, like that's literally how the day, well, that is that is how the incident started. So from that day, a murder happened. Um, it took about a week. It took about a week, but I, I was arrested a week later. Um, but when I was arrested, like I wasn't arrested how, how you'd think people get arrested for a murder. I was literally coming home from school. Um, there was a car. It wasn't a police car, just a normal car. And a guy came out the car and he asked me, he's like, are you, are you so-and-so? And I said, yeah. The thing is, when he, when he approached me, I wasn't, I, the, I wasn't sure who he was. He didn't, he didn't look like a gangster or anything. He didn't look scary, but he said, are you so-and-so? And I said, yeah, which I probably, it's a bit, yeah. I said, yeah. And he's like, okay, I'm detective, constable, blah, blah, blah. Um, I need to question you about an incident that took place. But he said it was for a violent disorder. So in my head, I knew what this was for because I was there, I went along. So I've gone into my house now. There's another policeman in my house. He sat with my mum. And I'm thinking, why didn't my mum tell me the police were here? But I'm guessing they've told her not to tell me. Um, so yeah, I've gone into my house and literally they're asking me a lot of questions. They're asking me, where were you? Uh, do you, what did you do on this day? Like, they're just telling me, like, just tell us your day. Tell us what happened on the 5th of May. And uh, I'll be honest, I just literally, I lied. I said, I finished school. I said, I went to play football with my friends. Um, and they were asking me what friends. I said, some friends from the park. They asked me for their number. I said, I don't have their number. I said, I just meet them up to play football. And um, even though I didn't do the murder, even though I didn't see the murder, I think it kind of frightened me that, you know, like police have come to me over this murder and I still didn't really understand how they came to me because I didn't do anything. But then that takes it back to the Oyster cards. These are the cards that we scanned on the buses. They're registered to us. So we scanned Oyster cards to go there. We scanned Oyster cards to come back. You can clearly see my face on CCTV. So I think after about 30, 40 minutes of questioning, they've now arrested me, uh, but they arrested me for something called violent disorder. Um, I'd never heard of this, of this charge before, but I just felt like violent disorder. It sounds a bit like, it sounds a bit violent, but um, there was nothing I could do. So I've been arrested now. Um, I've been taken to the police station, Lewisham police station. And um, I remember on the journey there, the police are telling me, they're like, um, yeah, you haven't done anything wrong. We know you're a good boy. You know, you go to a good school because I actually go to a grammar school. They were like, we know you go to a good school, you're a good boy, you know, just tell us, just tell us what happened and you can go home, you'll be fine. You know, you've got a good life ahead of you. And when they're telling me all these things, when they're speaking to me, I'm just thinking like, I am a good boy. Yeah, I didn't do anything. You know, let's, let's, okay, they want to question me, let's see where this goes, whatever. And then they also said to me, uh, if you get a solicitor, it could take, it could take, it could take quite long. It could take a few hours you want to go home, right? You want to go home? And I'll be honest with you, I wanted to go home. I wanted to just play Xbox again. I just wanted to go back on live, Xbox Live with my friends. So I thought, yeah, cool. I won't need a solicitor. So I've gone to the police station. I've been booked in at reception. Um, I've gone to my cell. Because I'm underage, I'm 15, I'm not an adult. Uh, you have to have a guardian or a parent, a legal guardian or a parent beside you when you have this police interview. So I got a phone call to to ring someone, obviously to act as a adult legal guardian. I rang my father, I rang my dad, and I said to him, yeah, dad, I've been arrested for a violent disorder. I don't know why. I didn't tell my dad I'd been there. I just said, I don't know why. 
they think I've done a violent disorder. I didn't even know what it was, but I said I've done a violent. They think I've done a violent disorder. Can you come to the police station? And um, I told him I don't want a solicitor. I said I don't want a solicitor. I just want to get this over with and go home. And my dad, he he was. <laughs> I just remember he he was not happy when I said that. He he literally made sure I got a solicitor. He told me no. He's like, Are you no. I just remember him shouting, no, you're getting a solicitor. So my dad's come to the police station. He's obviously waiting in a room. We've got a solicitor. We've got a duty solicitor. Like the duty is one is one that's just offered to you by the police. Um, it didn't take long. They made it out like I was going to be waiting for hours. It didn't take long. But um, I've gone into the interview now. I'm being questioned. Once again, on tape, by the detectives, two detectives. My dad sat beside me. My solicitor sat beside me. And um, now they're asking more detailed questions. They're like, I'd say when they asked me questions in my home, they were, they were more like, where were you? What did you see? What did you do? Now they're using real time. They're saying an incident took place at this time in this area. Where were you? I'm saying no comment. Who is this? No comment. They're showing uh, CCTV stills of me on the bus on the way to the park. They're saying, who's this? And I'm seeing these photos. It's obviously me, but I'm saying um, no comment. But I'm starting to like, now I'm starting to realise like, wow, like they're trying, to, they're trying to do me for something. They're trying to do me for something. But I've been advised to go no comment. So I've got no comment for the next 30, 40 minutes. They've um, they've adjourned the, the interview. I've had a little debrief with my solicitor and um, I'm basically saying to my solicitor, look, I didn't do the murder. I didn't see the murder. I kept it transparent with him. I told him I went along. I didn't do the murder. I didn't see the murder. You know, like what's going on here? And he basically, this is like the first time I was um, explained something called joint enterprise. Um, my solicitor was basically explaining to me joint enterprise is like a law that is used uh, in cases where there are like two or more people involved. Um, and joint enterprise was almost used, it's, it's, quite, it's used quite a lot in like gang cases because gangs go out in numbers to commit crimes. Um, and my solicitor was basically explaining to me that, you know, there's a chance that I could get life for this murder. And being 15, being naive, I literally was just looking at him thinking, what are you talking about? Like, I wasn't, I wasn't registering, the, I wasn't understanding the severity of what he was saying. Because my, my answer is, I didn't do it. I don't know what you're talking about. Obviously, I know I went along. I know I left the, the scene. I know a murder took place. I know somebody that I was with done the murder. But to me, I didn't do the murder. And I just felt like, how can, how can I get done for the murder? So I remember I was kind of, um, I wouldn't say arguing, but we were back and forthing. And like, he was explaining to me how he's got many clients from South London, similar age, in gangs, and they all thought the same thing. And they're all doing 18 years, 15 years, 16 years. He was telling me about kids that were 14, getting 16 years longer than they've lived. And... Um, I think I was in denial. I didn't want to accept that this was a possibility. So I remember being quite argumentative with my solicitor. So even though my solicitor is the one defending me, I was quite argumentative with him. I just didn't want to hear it. I did not want to hear it. Um, anyway, we've had our debrief and he's explained to me what joint enterprise is. Uh, I think a few, so I've gone back to my holding cell. A few hours later, I was given bail, police bail. Um, which meant I had to sign a bail document and basically I wasn't allowed to communicate with all my co-defendants, my co-defendants being all the other guys I went to the park with. Um, I also had to sign in to a police station twice a week, just put a sign just to prove I haven't run away or flown away. And every month I had like a review, a bail review. So this happened in May and um, literally twice a week I'm signing in, I'm signing in. So I got arrested a week after the murder. I think I found out around this time that two boys from my group that had gone along, they'd been arrested, but they weren't given police bail. They were remanded, like instantly remanded. 
I also found out um, when the police went to their house, it wasn't as friendly as mine. It wasn't a, are you so-and-so? Or we want to speak to you. Like I found out their houses were smashed in um, on police, red dots, literally guns pointed at them and they were handcuffed. Their family was handcuffed. Um, one boy, his house was actually like taken as evidence. So the, ha the family had to be rehoused. They literally wanted to just secure the house and just rip rip it apart. Um, yeah, so I've, I'm finding all this out and I'm thinking, okay, so there's a reason those guys have been sent to jail and there's a reason I've got bail because I know I, I didn't do it. At this point, I didn't really know who'd done it, but I'd assumed based on their fate, maybe they had more to do with it. So a month's gone by, it's June now, I've gone in for my review. So this review, you have to go in with a parent, you sign documents again, and it's been um, extended for another month. Another month's gone by. So bear in mind, by now, two guys from my group, they've been in prison for months. They've, they've been in prison, they're in prison. I'm on police bail, haven't been charged with anything, but I'm on police bail for a violent disorder. July has come. Um, I actually think it was the 14th of July, 2010. It was a Thursday. Um, earlier on in that week, I had a phone call with my solicitor and she was telling me the rest of the guys that were on police bail with me, one by one, they were all getting remanded. And um, she basically gave me the heads up to say, you, I've gone into the police station with my dad and I remember as I'm sat, like, I didn't even get to sign the papers. As I've checked in with my name, the clerk guy has gone off, a group of officers have come over, they've pulled out handcuffs and they said, we are arresting you. No, we are charging you with murder. And I think when they said that, that's when I kind of like understood, wow, like this, this, is, this is serious. And like, I'd never heard the word murder till this moment. This is when they said, we are charging you. We're not even arresting you. We're charging you with murder. And um, literally, I remember like, I didn't, I didn't know how to feel. It didn't feel real. It just happened very quickly. I walked in. Five minutes later, guys are surrounding me. My dad's there. Um, I didn't know how to feel. It happened so fast. And I just remember my dad saying, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. And I got taken away and I was put in a cell once again. Um, before I had the interview, the, the next interview with the police again, I had another debrief from my solicitor. And my solicitor's telling me, he's like, yeah, now all of you guys, all nine of you have been charged with murder and all nine of you are getting remanded. And I said to him, what's remanded? And he, he basically said, you'll be awaiting trial for murder in prison. And that's when I said, prison? Like, I've never been to prison. I didn't know anything about prison. All I knew was prison break. <laughs> All I knew was prison movies. And they don't look nice. People die. People get thrown over balconies. And I remember thinking, prison? And the funniest thing is, like, he said that to me. And then he left me to it. So I'm just sat in the cell again, thinking about prison for, like, a good 40 minutes. And then I was called in. Um, now we're doing our interview. <laughs> They're asking me more questions, but now they've got more like details. They've got, they had CCTV stills in the last one. Now they're showing pictures of a knife, the murder weapon with blood on it. I've never seen the murder weapon before, but they're showing me a knife with blood on it. They're saying, have you seen this? I'm saying no comment. They're saying, have you touched this? I'm saying no comment. Then they showed me another photo. This was another knife but this knife looked like the knife I touched and that made my heart just sink. I was thinking, oh my God, that literally looked like the knife that I touched and it was a zoomed in photo of the knife and then they showed me another knife, uh, sorry, another photo on paper and they said, look, and this photo was where the knife was found in the little construction skip, the construction skip where I'd thrown the knife and when I saw the evidence that was like linked to me. I think that's when like, I felt like, wow, this, yeah, this, this, this could go so wrong. Like, I wasn't sure if they thought I'd committed the murder. I wasn't sure if they thought I was trying to murder someone. But now I realized, yeah, this, this is not a joke. Like they've got, 
things for me. This is for me. This isn't for anyone else. That knife, I recognised it. I didn't see it for long, but I picked it up, so I remember the colour of it. And yeah, I just, um, I had to go no comment. I didn't, yeah, my solicitor advised me, go no comment. And yeah, I think after this interview, I went back to my cell, and this is when I just started like going into deep. Like I just started overthinking everything. I started thinking like, oh my God, like I'm going to get done for the murder. It wasn't even me. They're going to do me. Like I was assuming I'll get like 25 years, 30 years, because that's what you see in the papers. I'm only 15. And I'm thinking, I can't do 30 years. I'm 15. I can't do this. I can't do this. And um, yeah, I think I was in, I, I hadn't cried yet. I hadn't cried yet. You know, that's like, I think I was in such shock. I hadn't cried yet, but I remember just sitting there thinking, oh my God, I was just sweating out. And then, um, yeah, literally uh, a, few, a few hours later, um, I was taken, oh, sorry, no, not a few hours later. I had to spend, um, I think it was like one or two nights in a police station. I think I did a night there. And first thing in the morning, the next day, I had to go in front of a, 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 a judge, to go in front of a judge. Um, I think everyone is el uh, eligible to apply for bail. So previously I was given police bail. Now I've been charged for a murder. You can apply for bail. I've gone in front of a judge. Pff, the judge, like, it's murder. He didn't even bother explaining himself. Remanded. So instantly I was remanded. Um, I went back to the court cells because I'm in court. This was Southwark, Southwark Crown Court, not youth court, Southwark Crown Court. I'm in the, poli uh, the court cells and this time the cells are like, they're, they're quite dirty. Um, I'm seeing a lot of names, a lot of like nicknames, a lot of postcodes, a lot of areas. So I started to realise, yeah, so in jail, I'm going to see guys from North London, West London, East London. I'm seeing like, uh, for example, someone will put their name 2009. So someone wrote this last year, 2006. There's a lot of graffiti. And um, that's when I realised, oh, in jail... I'm gonna see guys from everywhere. And um, I had like a little microwave meal that they give you, this little like full English breakfast. That's all I had to eat. I couldn't really eat anyway. I was like, I just wasn't in a good way. Hadn't showered, hadn't brushed my teeth. Um, and then yeah, I think in the evening, afternoon, the jailer unlocked my door and he said to me, yeah, you're going, you're, you're going now. And I knew where I was going, but I said, where did you go in prison? And like, it's weird because it's almost like I wanted confirmation. Like, am I really going to prison? And he's, you're going to prison. But he said it so calmly. And like, I was just, I was just like, shit, man. Like, so I've walked out the cell. He took me to the bus. Um, it's called a circle bus. These are the buses that transport prisoners to and from court or to prison. Um, they're like big white vans. They've got the black windows. You can't really see, they're tinted. I've gone on the bus. And I remember I was the first one on the bus. I think the bus holds about four prisoners. I've sat in the back. They've locked me in. And um, as I've looked out the, the tinted window, I could see another prisoner getting escorted on the bus. Um, he looked quite big. So I didn't really look at him because I, I, <laughs> I didn't really want to look at people for too long. I didn't know how people would be. I saw him, looked away. He's come right up to my glass. And when he's looked in, he's recognised me. And he's gone, yo, it's you. Like, um, I used to be called Serge. That was my nickname, Serge. He's like, yo, Serge, is that you? And when I've looked up, I've realised, I recognised him. He was actually from my area. Um, he wasn't on my case, but he was someone from my area. Um, he was in court as well for something else. And when I saw him, I felt like, oh, like... And I asked him, where are you going? And he said, Cookham Wood, HMP Cookham Wood, which is a juvenile, a juvenile prison, um, 15 to 18-year-olds. And so he was going to the same prison as me. So I said, yeah, 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 I'm going there as well. And from that moment, I felt a lot better. Like, yeah, he was quite big. You know, he'd been in jail for a while. He had, he had muscles and like, I knew, yeah, I'm just going to hang around with him, man. I'm just going to, wherever he goes, I'm going to follow him. And then um, he's been seated. He's been locked in his little uh, cubicle cell in the, in the bus. Another guy has come on. Um... I didn't see this guy, <clears throat> I didn't see this guy through the window, but I just heard like the bus tilt a bit because of the weight of the officer and the prisoner. And then when I've looked, I recognised him. He was from my area as well. He was someone that I'd hung around with a few times. But he said, hey Serge, is that you? And I saw him. I thought, oh my God, yes. But I said, where are you going? 
He said, cook on wood. I said, yes. So now I know two guys. So I've never been to jail. I didn't think I would ever go to jail, but I'm going to jail with two guys I know. This guy as well, he's got muscles. I said, yeah, cool. I know two guys. I think the bus journey was like nearly two hours because it was in Kent in Rochester. It was quite a long way on the bus. We've got off um, at Cook and Wood. Um, we've gone through reception. They give us like a bed pack. Give us some like uh, you get like an induction pack. It's like a squash, chocolate bar, crisp, some sweets, toothbrush, things like that. Um, because we'd arrived so late, uh, that the core day was over. So induction. There's something you do called induction where they're teaching you about prison. If you're new, they'll teach you like the regime. That was all going to be the next day. But on the journey to the prison, I think those guys noticed I was quite nervous. Um, I was quite, I'd just been charged with murder. Like I'm going to jail on trial for a murder. So my head was already somewhere else. Um, I think I looked quite scared. I looked quite nervous. I was, I was quite skinny as well. And they just kind of reassured me. They were like, yeah, you'll be all right. You know, just 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 be around us. We've got it on lock. Like we've got on smash. And the, the actual jail I was going to had a lot of people from Lewisham, which is my borough. So there were actually people that we didn't get on with in there too. But for some reason, in prison, that beef was kind of put us put to rest. And I think the Lewisham people kind of stuck together because there was other groups on North London now, West London, East London, and um. I noticed there was some sort of unity in prison with like being from Lewisham. So they kind of reassured me, you'll be all right. Um, yeah, we've gone into the wings, gone onto the, like, gone into the wing, my induction pack, gone into the cell. And I had a TV, uh, only five channels. And uh, that was my first night in prison. And I remember just being in the cell and like, I think I, it's so mad because I think about it now and it's like, I remember I just kept on looking at the door because the door, it can be open from the outside. It's open, you have to put a key and a metal door and it slams and it jams shut. But when you're looking looking at the door from inside the cell, it's literally flat. Like there isn't anything you can open it with. There's no handle. And I remember like throughout that night, I was like, I must've been in some serious depression, stress. I remember I was just watching TV, but it wasn't registering. I'm literally just looking at, looking at like the screen, not really watching. And I remember I just kept on looking at the door. I don't know why. It's almost like I believed they were going to unlock it and say, yeah, you can go home or oh, it wasn't you. You can go home. And like, I think I looked at the door like pretty much like all the time. Just kept on looking at the door. And then, yeah, I just remember like it was such a long day. Eventually I had to go get my head down, go to sleep. I went to sleep. And then, yeah, the next day, like the induction process started. So induction is like um, all the new guys to the prison me and a few others, we'd just come in, we'd be sat down by officers, they would give us sheets with the routine, like eight o'clock, breakfast, nine o'clock, education, gym at 2 p.m., association at five. And then, um, yeah, I kind of realized now I'm in jail, man. I'm in jail, like I'm not guilty. I haven't been sentenced, but I'm in jail, man. Um, I've come out on association. Association in America, they call it rec time, like recreational time, time you can use the phone, have a shower, so when I've come out on association, there's a few guys that I knew, those guys that I knew, I spoke to them, but I'm kind of just observing and I'm seeing like, I'm just like everyone's in uniform, like in um, in this specific prison, we have to wear green, green tops um, and like gray combats. You could wear your own trainers. But I just remember looking around and thinking, wow, there's like 60 gang members from all over London, all in the same room and like, you don't really see that in London, like you, like unless you go to like a carnival or like a massive event, like you don't really see this. But what was weird to me was everyone was happy. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like I've been charged with murder. I'm not happy. I'm stressed. I'm depressed. These guys have been here for a while. They're kind of in routine. They're playing table tennis. They're on the phone chatting to girls. They're playing snooker pool. They're on they're watching TV on a big screen on a, in the rec room. And I'm thinking like, ain't these guys stressed? But I realized, um, you know, you can be stressed in jail, but it doesn't do anything good for you. You have to just get on with your time and ride your time. And then, yeah, from there, like I'm speaking to different guys, I'm telling them my situation. 
And I've re- what I realised is when you go to prison, um, everyone holds on to this bit of hope that you're going home. You always believe you're going home. I don't think I've met a guy that's ever come to jail and said, I'm going to jail. Like, I'm, I'm getting guilty. I've never seen that. Every, like Someone could do something on camera. Someone could be banged to rights. They're always pleading not guilty. Nope, I didn't do it. And literally, I'm telling people my story. I'm almost trying to convince people, yeah, I'm innocent, man. I'm innocent, man. And um, I realise people in prison, they're not really they're not really sympathetic. Like, no one really, like, no one really cared. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, yeah. He didn't do it either, you know. And I'm like, what? And then they said there was a guy, I remember there was a guy from East. They said he didn't do it either. So I didn't know this guy, but I just said, it's, when I'm looking back, it's like so crazy. But I just went up to him and said, are you in for murder? And obviously that's not something you should do. But I said, are you in for murder? He said, yeah. And I said, some guy said you didn't do it. And then he's like, nah, joint enterprise. And when he said the word joint enterprise, that's when my heart sunk. That's when I think, yeah. So this this is a real thing. And then um, I didn't even want to ask him. But I asked him, I said, how long did you get? He said he got 16 years. And like, he'd already been in for two. And I'm looking at him thinking, how is he like, how is he all right with this? How is he all right with this? Like, how was he, I just, it, I just didn't understand. How is he all right? You're doing 16 years. How are you even smiling and how? I didn't understand it. And then um, I've been given a phone call as well a bit later on in the day. I've spoke to my family and they're like, yeah, my mum was really sad, man. She was crying. But they were telling me like, they're going to get me out. They were like, don't worry, you didn't do it. You'll be fine. And then I'm saying to my mum like, I can't, I can't do 15 years, man. I can't do 15 years. And I'm telling her, like, there's guys in there doing 15 years, 14 years for joint enterprise. And, like, she's saying, don't worry, you'll come home. We're going to get you home, I promise you. And, um, yeah, that was the second day. And that night, when I got locked up, yeah, I remember, that was the night, like, yeah, I, I started crying, man. I was just thinking, oh, like, no, oh, like, I'm going to go jail. Because I'd met guys now that are gone jail for joint enterprise, do you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, no, nah, like, before it just, I was in denial. Now that I've met guys, I was just like, no, nah, man, I can't go to jail for this. And bear in mind, I didn't know the dynamics of my case. Like, I didn't know if the police, I didn't even know if the, I thought the police thought I did it. Do you know what I mean? I thought the police were, like, pinning this on me. And I was thinking, like, it wasn't me, like, are they really going to put me on trial? Because I knew everyone had been remanded, but the police weren't giving much away in the interview. They were just showing me knives. And I knew they knew I touched that knife because I was thinking, why would they, sh-? like, just, just the way they showed me the photo of my one, the one I touched, I felt like they knew I touched it. And, like, yeah, that night, I just remember I was crying and, like, I was trying to eat, like, cookies with milk to feel better. And, yeah, man, I just, like... I just couldn't really sleep properly. And I just remember, like, I was just, like, I was proper emotional. I was crying. And then I think, yeah, day three, I just just started getting a bit used to jail a bit more. I just wanted to get into the gym. I was kind of, like, slowly preparing myself. Um, Yeah, and then just literally just routine, education, induction, going to the gym. I was getting visits off my family. And then a month had passed. And I remember an uh, officer told me, you've got a call with your solicitor. And um, I got a call from my solicitor. I got into the office. He's like, oh my God, I've got amazing news. I've got amazing news. You've got bail. And I was thinking, bail? He said, you've got bail, your your family. Because my dad basically put up for, he put money up to the courts. He surrendered like 15K. He had to surrender my passport. Um, I had to agree to like electronic monitoring, a tag, an ankle tag. And he said, you got bail. And the feeling that I felt is like, I'm out of here. I'm out of it. Like, I felt like the cases had been dropped. You know what I mean? I'm only on bail, but it felt like the case is done. The case is over with. And um, my solicitor told me, don't tell anyone you got bail. Don't tell anyone. And then I was thinking, why? Because obviously people get jealous. I can understand. I didn't understand then, but I was so excited. When I've come out of the office and gone back to the landing, I remember saying, I got bail. I got bail. You, man, I got bail. And people were shocked. They're like, you got bail? People weren't getting bail for GBH. I got bail for murder. Do you know what I'm saying? People were shot like, oh my God, got bail. So the little few bits and bobs I had in my cell, my chocolate bars I'd give out, I'd give out to people. I took a lot of numbers. Uh, 
not numbers, sorry. I took a lot of prison numbers and names. And at the moment, in that moment, I promised loads of people, I'm going to write to you. I'm going to write to you. Like when I got out, I can't lie. Like I did, I, 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 it literally just went straight over my head. I didn't even think of them again. Sad to say. But um, yeah, so now I've got bail. I'm out. I did 30 something days in prison on remand for murder. But now I'm on a, this is like proper bail. This isn't police bail like previously. This is a, this is on bail awaiting trial with judge and chambers bail. And um, at this point, it was like the summer holidays. I just turned 16 as well. So I just turned 16 in prison, then got bail. So I'd missed my 16th. So I'm out now. Um, I had to like adhere to some, it's, it was called ISSP, I think Intense Super, Intense Supervisional, Supervisional Program, ISP. It was basically probation for children. And um, I just had to go like probation every day. We did activities. And um, I did this all the way till September. Uh, September was when I started sixth form. So I'd managed to get myself eight GCSEs in school, eight passes. And um, I got into a sixth form. And yeah, I was, I was studying four AS levels at sixth form. I started my academic year, year, year 12. In September 2011, I was studying AS drama, uh, AS business, um, AS government and politics. <laughs> Um, what was the last of drama business and media I did media studies as well um, my trial date my trial date was set for January 2011 so come December Christmas holidays you know I was going to trial um, if I would have got off got a not guilty I intended to go back to my studies but um, that wasn't the case what, what was how did it feel to lead up to trial um, so the lead up to trial like, I'll be honest with you, the fact that I got bail for murder, it it just, it made me think, yeah, they know what's happened now. They give me bail. They know I didn't do it. You know, I wasn't, like I say, I didn't see when the stabbing actually took place. So that kind of made me feel like, yeah, I'll be all right, man. Like, I didn't do this murder. Um, they've given me bail. Why would you give me bail? You know, because... um. I told you there was nine of us that got remanded. When I was given bail, I didn't know this till I was, till I was released on bail. Uh, three people had been given bail out of nine. Uh, three people being those two kids that came along because even those kids got charged with murder and they just came along. They just wanted to see what was going on. They came along. Um, so there's three of us on bail for murder. A month later, another guy gets bailed for murder. So in my head, you've charged nine of us with murder that I'm guessing only one person's done, but four of us are out. Like we're out, we're free. Like we're in the streets. We're not in the streets, but we're, <laughs> we're out. Do you know what I mean? My curfew was for seven. So I had to be in by 7 p.m. every day. Um, and I'd say the lead up to trial, I just, um, you know, like I was seeing girls, I was going shopping and, um, it's it's a weird one because I wasn't close with my family uh, from about 2009 onwards. And when I was arrested for this murder, it's a weird thing to say, but I was kind of shocked with the support they showed me, like sending me money, visiting me every week, sending me whatever I needed, writing me letters. My mum would write me two page letters like every few days. Do you know what I mean? And um, even though they're my parents, I just felt like because I wasn't respecting them and listening to them and always going out, I was quite shocked to like, the support they showed me. And um, when I got bail, we actually became a lot closer as a family unit. Um, I would, you know, I'm on tag now, so I'm going to be home for dinner because <laughs> I have to be home for dinner. You know, we're eating food. Um, my mum's Japanese, so my mum's making a lot of Japanese food. Um, I'm actually eating food with my mum, my dad, my brother. We're, we're actually getting closer. We're getting closer. And um, that feeling of being close with my family again and really seeing who loves you and who's there for you was more, it was more like, it just fueled me to say, yeah, we're like, once this case is done, I'm done. Like, I'm out of this stuff, man. Like, I'm done with this. I don't want to go back to prison. I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to be away from my family. Do you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, I'd say like the build up to trial, I kind of, I was confident. I just felt like, yeah, I didn't do it, man. Like, come on. 
get all the evidence you need. You'll see I didn't do it. It'll be fine. Uh, trials started now. January the 2nd, I remember. 2nd of January, 2011. The first day of trial. And um, first day of trial, not much happened. Um, they were jury picking. So they're trying to like sort out who's going to serve it on the jury, the panel of 12. But um, one thing I remember when trial started, so I was actually on trial in the Old Bailey, which is the central criminal court. That's like, that's like the main court in this country. That is the court where you will get natural life, you'll get triple life sentences. Like that's, people used to be hanged in that court. Um, so I've gone in there, I'm 16, I'm on trial, I'm in the dock. And uh, the courtroom was enormous. And like, I just remember thinking like, this is a court that I used to see on television <laughs> as a child. And I'm actually on trial for a murder. So I think it got real again. It got real, like I'm seeing a judge with a wig, I'm seeing all of my barristers with legal team of wigs. I'm seeing media, even on the way into court, um, I, was getting, I was getting photos taken of me, like flash tsh, tsh, photos. And I remember saying to my mum, hey, what are they doing? And, and um, my mum was speaking to my solicitor saying they're taking photos, but my solicitor was explaining that, you know, these are, they, they can do that, they're the media, you, you can't, there's nothing you can say. And that's when I kind of realised, wow, like this is like, this is serious, like they're taking photos of me, they're taking photos of my family. Um, I even saw the, the victim's family um, within the courtroom as well. And it kind of saddened me as well because I'd never, obviously I didn't know the victim, I'd never seen the family before, but I could see how sad they were, do you know what I mean? I could see how upset they were from this whole experience and like, I couldn't look at them. I felt, even though I didn't do it, I felt guilty. I felt like, shit man, like this is their kid, do you know what I'm saying? Like someone's died, man. Like I couldn't even imagine what they were going through because I knew what my family were going through when I went to jail and I'm alive. I'm actually out on bail now, so like I couldn't even. Now yeah, I remember, like I just, I just never wanted to, like not in like a rude way, but I didn't really want to ever like look in them in their eyes. I just felt like, I just proper felt bad. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah, trial started. I'm on trial now. Trial took about two months, but within that two months, it just starts from all the witnesses. All the witnesses. Uh, it's the prosecution case first. So the prosecution have to give their case to the jury. And then we give our case to the jury, like we give our defense to the jury. So the prosecution case, they first started, uh, they they kind of created this narrative that uh, we were all like violent killers. Um, they created a narrative that we all set out to kill. They created a narrative that we all intended to kill or stab, at least stab. That's what they were saying. And... Um, it's hard hearing these things when you're sat in a dock because you want to shout and say, no, it's not true, it's not right, you want to, but everyone has their time to speak and you can't just shout out in court and you get done for contempt. So I had to sit there and hear it and it was hard hearing it because like they're labelling us killers, do you know what I mean? Like they're labelling all of us killers, they're saying I'm a killer. And like, even though I was involved in the street life, I was involved with gangs, um, I never, like, I never wanted to be a killer or labelled a killer. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just wanted to be cool. I just wanted to be like tough. And that word killer was so harsh. I was just like, wow, like, I'm not a killer. And um, prosecution case starts unfolding. They're bringing in witnesses. Um, they're bringing in loads of witnesses. Um, it even goes all the way back to the school incident. Uh, the headmaster of the school is in the stand. And he's explaining the first altercation with those two boys who came to the school to confront my friends. And he's explaining how when these two boys rocked up, the whole atmosphere, the energy kind of shifted. Um, the two boys that confronted my friend at the school, they were quite, they were known in the area. They were known for like violent things. They were known like, they were quite prolific gang members. And, um, yeah, the headmaster was even saying when he saw the two boys, he knew it was trouble. And um, he was watching the whole thing. He watched the whole thing unfold. He watched them enter the school. He watched them go straight up to my friends. And um, it kind of made me realise, wow, like the prosecution case, like they've like, 
they've got the whole day they've got the whole day mapped out they've got it from the school um the altercation after um so they got that altercation then they go on to the cctv of my friends leaving the school they've got the cctv of us meeting up in our area they've got the cctv of us getting on the bus they've got the cctv of us making phone calls so that's when I started to realise like, wow, like they piece a case together as if it's a film, like a movie. It's all like step by step. They got stills, they got evidence, they got video footage, they've got eyewitness statements. Um and yeah, trial's going on. I'd say trial took trial took two months, but I can't be specific with like this happened on this week or this happened this week, but um a lot of witnesses, a lot of witnesses. And um there was even a woman. So in my defence my main defence was, yes, I went along. Yes, I understood there could have been a fight. But to my knowledge, we were just having a little fight like boys do. You know, like I've had fights. Like I'm not saying it's right, but a lot of boys have fights growing up. Do you know what I mean? Like I was 15 years of age. I've had fights in school. I've had fights behind the bin shed. Like you fight, make up, whatever. I've gone along to this event, this, this altercation, um, just thinking, yeah, we're just going to have a fight. But um, I didn't actually see any weapons until they were discarded by that first group. And um, my defence with the whole actual murder was through going through a lot of evidence with my solicitor, I worked out that the second chase, when I explained how I saw the guy that I found out later to be the victim, the second chase, when the guy was running towards us and he did a left, that was when a few guys from my group had chased the boy, uh, chased the boy down the park and that was like the last few seconds before the stabbing took place and that's the reason I didn't see the actual stabbing because I was so concentrating I was concentrating solely on the guy with a sword who had threatened to cut me and um, yeah my defence was um, during this whole incident remember I told you guys there was people in flats people in the streets watching there was a live phone call from a lady um, she was on the third floor so she was she was like at quite some height and she's like almost she's got like a bird's eye view of the entire park she can see the whole park to the end to the pavement and she did a live phone call um to literally ring in the police as it's all going off as it's all kicking off and she basically describes how uh she describes the first chase and then she says the boys are just loitering and then she describes oh the boys have come back the other boys that's the second time when they've come back with the weapons and then she says now they're like shouting whatever and then she says, oh my God, now they're chasing the boys. So that's the second chase where we've ran towards them again. Oh my God, they've chased the boys. As I've chased the boys, remember I told you guys, obviously I've got the knife. She says, there's a mixed race boy. He's got a knife. He's in school uniform. And she's literally placed me out of the park because the flat she's in, if I was to have looked up, I would have seen her, but I didn't see her. But she was looking right at me and she said, he's in the road. He's got a knife. And he's basically like, he's like, sh he's looking down the road. Because remember I told you, I turned and I was looking at them, pussy holes, whatever. And she said, he's shouting at them, blah, blah, blah. And literally five seconds later, we got the exact timing. Five seconds later, she's gone, oh my God, oh my God. They've just chased the boy out the park. They've just chased him out the park. So with that uh, audio footage, uh, audio, like that was my defense. Like, yes, I went along. Yes, I got involved in a confrontation. Yes, I picked up a knife. I shouldn't have. I was scared. Yes, but that final chase of the victim, I didn't take part in it. I didn't see it. And where she had said they've just chased the boy out of the park, remember, she's placed me on the pavement and that park is 200 metres. So literally, as soon as I'm in the pavement, five seconds later, 200 metres that way, the boy has just been chased out and she said about a group three or four have just chased him out but she could blatantly tell that I think I'm not sure how she could tell but she could kind of tell who was with what group based on the distance so where the victim was quite a bit ahead of that group she said they've chasing him and she knew the first time they've chased them out and um, that was my defence like you know I hold my hands up to the knife I hold my hands up to being stupid and going long but I didn't see the murder. I didn't chase the boy. I didn't encourage anyone. Do you know what I mean? I didn't try to stab anyone. I had the knife, but I just I just didn't feel safe. I didn't really feel comfortable with the guys that had swords. So that was my defense. 
come trial, that same woman who I thought was going to save me, when she's come to the dock, uh, the stand, sorry, she said something completely different. <sighs> and like, we do cross-examination. So my barrister pulled her apart. Like, you know, we got this, let's listen to the audio. We've played it in court. Let's listen to the audio. Let's listen. Let's read out your statement. And then she's like, nah, I've got it all wrong. And my barrister was like, how can you have got it all wrong? Like this live phone call is live. It's happened right in front of your eyes. <laughs> if you see something and try to like, you know, try to explain it seven months later, you're going to forget bits and pieces. You're going to get things wrong. We're all human. But this live audio how could you have got it wrong? You're literally explaining what's in front of your eyes. But she said, nope, nope, I've got it all wrong. I've got it all wrong. And um, one thing my barrister did, which made sense a lot later, he would ask every single witness, did you know the victim's family or the victim? And a lot of them openly said, yeah, that they admitted it. And I didn't understand why he would ask them that. But then I felt like he just wanted the jury to know you know, don't be surprised if people are gonna like try to secure a conviction because you know, like they so understand, didn't it? Like you feel, you feel like you're obliged to help. You know, you know the victim's family because, like I say, nobody knew who had died until a few days later, or it was like pronounced on the news. So a live phone call, she didn't know who the guy was. When she realised who it was, that the, the statements changed. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? So that was a blow to me because I felt like, wow, the one piece of evidence that probably could have saved me, she wasn't, she disagreed with it. But I felt like, you know, the jury are here, they're listening. They're not, they're not silly. They c can make up their own mind. Like, come on, like at the end of the day, the live phone call is going to be more accurate than a statement you've remade like a week later. Um, Yeah, so that's happened. You know, I've even gone on the stand myself. I've gone on the stand. And uh, one thing that my barrister told me was, he said, on a murder trial, if you refuse to go on the stand, it's suicide. You're on trial for your life. You're on trial for murder. If you do not go on that stand and explain your actions or what happened that day, it just looks bad. So I made a conscious decision. I took the stand. Um, I got cross-examined for like, like a day and a half. Not like a whole day, but like a core day of trial. There was obviously lunch and adjournments, but like I was getting roasted. Like they were asking me a million questions, but I felt like I wasn't lying about anything. I was just genuinely telling the truth. So I, I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't nervous. Like I knew I didn't do it. I knew I didn't see it. So if they were ever asking me questions that like could incriminate others, I didn't, I didn't see what happened. So I just felt like, you know, I'll be, I'm just, I can only speak for what I did. I can't speak for what he did. Um, I did well anyway. I did well. Um, it was like few points where it wasn't looking good, but I managed to kind of bring it round because like I say, I didn't, I could only say what I saw. So I felt like that went well. I felt like, yeah, this is, this trial is going okay for me. Um, it wasn't going as well for others, as you can imagine, like people that are a bit more involved, but I'm just thinking of me. I, I, I want to go home in it. I'm not, I'm, I'm, it, it might be selfish I want to go home I didn't do it like I don't deserve to be here trial was still going on um, they're bringing up a lot of like bad character that's what they call it so with joint enterprise cases they don't really have much joint enterprise is used when there isn't much evidence on people so they use like alternative things to kind of like build up a character so uh, one of my co-defendants another guy that was on my trial he was in a few rap videos um, and they would use his rap videos in court and say, look, he's rapping about violence. He's making music videos in like an enemy territory, which he was doing, which he did. And even though that had nothing to do with the trial, it was almost like to show the jury, you know, you can't let these guys go home. These guys are, these guys are dangerous guys. These guys are serious guys. So they were using a lot of bad character. Um, they brought up like times I was stopped and searched. Stopped and searched quite a lot of times. Um, uh, a bandana, someone had a bandana in their house, a blue bandana. 
and they said, yeah, this symbolizes gang gang affiliation, just little things like that. And um, yeah, me, I just still believe like, yeah, I wouldn't, like I didn't do, I didn't do the murder. Oh yeah, I want to say as well, so even during trial, yeah, all the evidence has come out now, all the CCTV footage has come out. There's CCTV footage of the actual stabbing. Like you can see the actual stabbing. You don't see the knife go in, but you see the swing motion of the stab that actually like the fatal stab that stabbed the victim. Um, I found out later on in trial, that specific moment when we ran at the group the second time and the victim had ran to the left, uh, there was three boys within my group who instead of chasing the main group, they kind of turned to the right. So if a guy is running towards you, he's gonna turn left and we're running towards him. So we, they we, they turned right. So they followed him off in that direction. And um, in trial, like there's CCTV stills of buses. I didn't know buses, uh, they film outwards. So when buses are driving past, they are actually filming outwards onto the pavement. And they were still showing the, the three boys from my group, like kind of gaining towards the victim. And um, I didn't know. So I found out later on in trial, there was three of them. Um, and literally the victim was chased through the park. He ran into the pavement. And when he got into the, sorry, he ran to the pavement. And uh, where the pavement is, there's a road. So summer's day, it's May, it's a hot day. There was, there was still traffic. So there's loads of cars just all just stuck in traffic. And literally one of the witnesses, well, not one loads of witnesses were in still traffic and then um, the main guy he literally said I was in my car I was in still traffic I saw a boy running he was being chased by three other boys who were like just quite but just fairly a bit behind him I noticed the boy at the front of the three had a knife in his hand and he basically said I saw the boy lunge forward and stab the boy that was being chased in his back um, in court I found out he was stabbed uh just under his left shoulder and it, it punctured a pulmonary vein. And like, um, yeah, like that's like severe blood loss. If you cut one of those veins, it's, it's like you lose a lot of blood. So as he stabbed him, the victim has, you know, tried to like fend him off, fight him off. Uh, he's kind of like, I, c I can't remember exactly what he did, but I, and I remember he said the victim tried to like, it was almost like a, a sudden reaction when you get stabbed or when you get hit, his body jilted and tried to like hit the guy that stabbed him. Obviously, the guy that stabbed him had moved back. The victim, after he'd been stabbed, he actually, like, leant on this actual witness's car. He leant on his BMW to try and, like, catch, to try and steady himself up. I think the blow to his back was quite, like, it was a big blow. Do you know what I mean? He fell forward and he put his hand on the BMW. And even in trial, the victim's fingerprints was even on the bonnet. Like, he used the bonnet to kind of gain himself up. Um, that's happened. There was another boy, like, besides... The boy that done the stabbing, like he didn't do the stabbing with him, but he was like beside him. And the third boy that was running in that group, he was quite behind. But after the the victim had been stabbed, the third boy, he, he'd carried on running towards the victim. So the victim had now been stabbed. He would fell onto the car. He'd made way into the chicken shop. He'd closed the chicken shop door. That third boy had ran all the way across the road onto the pavement and he fly kicked the door trying to get in or trying to get to the victim. He fly kicked the door. Um, the victim had his body weight like against the door so he couldn't get in obviously. Um, and yeah, literally that was the, 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 the final, the final events of the day. So the victim had been stabbed and the third boy had fly kicked the door. He couldn't get in. And then from there, those three started making their way off shortly after. Everyone else is coming at the park bit by bit. Um, the CCTV from inside the chicken shop filming out was used in trial. Um, and that's where you see the swing, the swing motion. And that was the exact moment the boy was stabbed. And after you see the swing, you even see the fly kick guy come out of nowhere. Um, and then after that, the CCTV just shows the victim just literally clutching onto the door. And within the next 50 seconds, you see people leaving the park. They're little, you can just see bodies coming out the corner of the camera and they're leaving the park one by one. 46 seconds later, after the stabbing, I come out of the park and you can clearly see that it's me 
Um, I'm the only mixed race guy. Uh, all my co-defendants were black. Um, some were quite dark skin or brown skin. I was the only mixed race guy. You can see it's me. You can see it's my jacket. So I'm saying I'm 46 seconds away running time. 46 seconds running time. Do you know how long of a distance that is after the stabbing? But yeah, they didn't. That wasn't that. They didn't really. They didn't budge. And uh, initially when the trial started, the whole prosecution case was if anyone is involved in the final chase of the victim, that is where the joint enterprise is. So we just had to show the jury we weren't involved in the final chase. And a lot of us could prove we weren't in the final chase because of this CCTV that they used, the prosecution used. Towards the end of trial, I don't even know how this happened, but I remember my barrister basically said there was like a legal argument where they changed the final chase being guilty to everyone that went along being guilty. So they basically moved the goalpost of who was going to be guilty of the murder. So throughout trial, I was always confident because I knew I wasn't in that final chase. I didn't know who was in it till I saw the CCTV, but the CCTV almost saved me because I said, look, I'm 46 seconds away. I could have been in the chase. But then they changed like the legal passage or whatever you want to call it. They changed like the legal steps to being found guilty. And I didn't understand how this was fair, but I was still confident. I still thought, yeah, we can, I can still get a not guilty. Two months have gone. It's time for a jury to deliberate. And like they took, so there's six of us on trial for this. There was nine of us on trial, but there were six of us on trial one and three people on trial two. So they took six days. I remember Monday to Friday deliberating. And during deliberation, the jury are just sat in a room speaking, going over everything whilst I'm on bail with a few others. We're sat in the lobby with our solicitors and our parents. We're sat in like the hallways. The people that were in remand, they're sat in the cells. So they're just like bored out their heads, sat in the cells all day. And for, it took a whole week and we came back on the Monday. That was the sixth day because Monday to Friday. Monday's the sixth day and Monday finished and Tuesday was the day we were all called in, court 14, court 14. And I just knew, I just done the maths. I said, there's six of us on trial. They've had six days to deliberate. I think they dedicated a day each. And then like on a Tuesday, they called us all in. And literally the foreman stood up. We have reached the verdict, Your Honor. And um, we were all placed, sorry, we were all placed in a indictment order. So I told you there were six of us on trial. The person that sat at number one, he's called uh, the principal party. Um, if you're a principal party, like prosecution cases that you, you, you were the guy, you were the perp, you were the perpetrator, you done the murder. I was number four. I was the fourth on the indictment. The two after me, fifth and sixth, they were the little kids that just came along. So even the seating plan alone kind of told me, look, I'm this end. I'm not that end. And obviously the one, two and three were the three in the chase. So indictment order, they're going through the first guy. And we all had to stand. We all stood up. They're like, first guy, do you find this defendant guilty or not guilty? They said guilty. And then I just heard loads of shrieks like, oh, in the gallery. Because obviously like we have family members in there. And that moment, yeah, like I was like, I was so scared. Because then I realized like, Someone saying a word could change your whole life. Uh, literally, a word will change your whole life. I heard guilty, and like when I heard it, I knew he's been he's been found guilty. I wasn't surprised, but like it's real now when it he's been found guilty. The second defendant, guilty or not guilty, they said guilty. So I was thinking, oh my god, it's coming because I'm number four. The third guy is next to me, number three, defendant number three. Do you find him guilty or not guilty? I heard not guilty. I heard not guilty. And I was thinking, oh my God, he got not guilty. And me hearing him getting a not guilty, I was thinking, I'm going to get not guilty. I'm going to get not guilty. But then they said, for the secondary charge of manslaughter, guilty or not guilty, they said guilty. So I registered, he got manslaughter for kicking the door when he was chasing the victim. I said, all right. I don't want manslaughter, but 
I don't want murder. I'll take manslaughter any day. It's come to me. Do you find a defendant guilty or not guilty for murder? They said guilty. And then I just thought, oh my, how did, I just, I was just like, I was like, how did, how did that just happen? How did that happen? He, he was there. He was there. He chased him. He got not guilty. I got guilty. And I remember like, after I heard that, I just didn't like, everything was just like, everything was just like, the pitch of everything was just pitched out. It was almost like, you know when you have feedback on a microphone, a lot of feedback, it was just feedback. I was just thinking, wow, like, I was just processing. I got found guilty of this murder. Like throughout my arrest to trial, I had so many ups and downs where I felt like I'm going to go jail. I'm not going to go jail. I'm going to go jail. I'm not going to go jail. And now I'm actually going to go jail for the murder. Um, the guy next to me, number five, he got not guilty. Manslaughter, he got not guilty. They didn't deserve to go to prison. Do you know what I mean? They didn't, they weren't involved in anything. They didn't, they literally were just naive. We were all naive. They were naive. They were 13 or 14. They didn't deserve any jail time. They'd already been remanded like that. I think that, that had traumatized them as it is, yeah? They'd been in jail for remand. The sixth guy got not guilty for murder, not guilty for manslaughter. Um, the judge even said, you guys can leave, like those two. And I remember, uh, literally as soon as they heard that they <laughs> they didn't even pick up their coats they literally just left uh, one of the guys said to me like he literally went like that to me went like, and like yeah I just thought oh man that's mad like. and then um, yeah that was literally the day I was convicted of murder and from that day onwards I was labelled a murderer yeah and um, were your family in the courtroom yeah my what was family, that like pff, that was crazy so everyone was um so 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 these guys had left now and there was just so much remember i'm still in some i'm just staring into the distance i'm just staring into the distance i remember i sat down at one point and i had a i had a bible as well and i remember i threw the bible like i just threw it on the floor shouldn't have done it but i was just i was just so pissed off i threw the bible on the floor and i remember sitting down and i remember i didn't want to like i didn't want to look at anyone i'm not going to lie to you i didn't want to look at the prosecution or the police because I felt like they'll be smiling. I didn't want to look at the media because they would see how sad I was. I didn't want to look at my parents because I knew they'll be sad. I didn't want them to see how sad I was. I just didn't want to look at anyone. I kind of like, I think that's like the only time in my whole life where like I literally just wish I could have just disappeared, just disappeared, like just literally just vanished. Do you know what I mean? I remember just looking down and then I do remember there was a lot of commotion. Like there was a lot of like noise there was a lot of like crying. Um, no one was cheering. There wasn't anyone cheering. It was all just people just in, just upset. And um, yeah, literally the judge was like, you can take them down. Number one's been took down, number two, number three. And I've been taken down and like all this time, I didn't want to look at my parents. I didn't want to look at them. I didn't want to, I just didn't want them to see how unhappy I was, how sad I was. And just before I went through the door, I remember I looked up, I turned back and I saw my mum and like my mum, man, I've never seen her like she was crying, man. She was just like, she just couldn't stop crying. And like my dad, my dad's a tough guy. Do you know what I'm saying? He's a tough guy, like African man. He weren't crying, but oh, he looked like he was crying, man. And I remember he was just holding my mum and like, shit, man, that, that, that hit me, man. I can't lie. Like when I saw them, I remember like I was holding back my tears. I've gone down to the cell. And then yeah, as soon as I hit the cell, I was just crying, man. I was just crying, I was so pissed. But like, I wasn't pissed as in angry. I was just like, I just couldn't believe what had happened. Do you know what I mean? I couldn't believe what happened. And um, what my brain was struggling to process was the fact that how can some random guy say one word, guilty, and that just changes my entire reality. Do you know what I mean? It changed my entire reality. And I remember I was sat in the cell, I was just like, yeah, I was just, I can't even remember how I felt. I'd be lying if I said, cause like, I was like, I wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't there because like, I've been to jail for this on remand. I'd been to prison, but now I'm doing time. Like I'm doing time for this. Do you know what I mean? I'm doing time, I'm 16, but I know for murders you're getting time. So yeah, man, I was just, I can't lie. I was just, I was just in a bad way. And then um, I remember my, 
uh, probation worker, my youth God. offending, they call it yacht, youth offending team. My yacht officer came to see me and she was trying to like cheer me up. She's like, you're going to be a baby still. You're going to be 28. You're still a baby. And when she said that, I'm not going to lie, like it proper pissed me off. I said, no, that's old. That's old. Like you can't tell a 16 year old 28 is a baby. Do you know what I mean? Like I was like, that's old. I literally like shouted, that's old. Like I was so angry, man. When and did like, you get sentenced? Um, so when I was found guilty, this was in March 2011, I was actually sentenced in August 2011. The reason I was sentenced so late is because remember there was three guys left, um, three guys left, so they were on a separate trial and um, there was even a fourth guy added to the trial. Um, this guy was added because uh, he he had involvement discarding clothes. He So he wasn't there on a the day of the murder. He had nothing to do with the murder, but he was caught with clothing of some of the people on the day of the murder. And for that, they done him for perverting the cause of justice. So they added him onto that trial. So there was four people on the next trial. So we didn't get sentenced until the outcome of the second trial. Um, the outcome of the second trial was everyone got manslaughter. Nobody got murder. No one got murder. So sentencing came um, August the 4th, 2011, um, four days before my 17th birthday. And um, yeah, the judge was reading out, he's summing up the judge's uh, sentencing. And basically like, he was explaining how, um, you know, we were set out on a venture. Um, someone lost their life. And he was basically explaining how joint enterprise is, 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 is an important tool in life because you know it convicts not only the perpetrator but those involved and um he was basically like just justifying like this was a the conviction was just he was explaining how you know we all are gonna have to reflect on our actions for a substantial amount of time behind bars um and yeah the sentencing was handed down the guy that actually committed the murder he was given 15 years um the guy that was beside him when the murder took place, he was given 14 years. Um, and then, uh, so I had gone from being fourth on the indictment to third now, because that third guy, because he got manslaughter, he swapped with me. So I'm third now. So I was given 12 years. Um, We're expecting that. I'll be honest with you. I had already like, I had already expected, I expected more. My barristers told me, expect a 15. So... It's it's mad saying it, but when I got my 12, I felt relief. It's mad saying it, but I I'd already accepted it by then. Do you know what I mean? I accepted it. I'm going to do a long time. And I thought 15. So when I got 12, I was like, 12. Okay. But you don't do 50% for murder, do you? You have to do no, the whole thing. So, yeah, so with murder, um, so as an adult, if you're 18 and you commit a murder in this country, you will get a sentence called discretionary life sentence, which means you do like, you do a minimum tariff so you'll be sentenced to life, which basically is 99 years. You'll be given a minimum tariff that you must serve before you're eligible to apply for release. So you're not guaranteed release. Um, I think it's the same system in America. But I was given 12 years, knowing that I'll have to do 12. Um, knowing that I'll have to do 12, sorry. Um, and I was going to say as well, when the, U when the yacht team said you'll be 28, that was on my sentencing. I just remember that was on my sentencing. So I've got that mixed up. I don't know if you edit that, but. Yeah, that's <laughs> but, why I asked the question, because I thought you'd jump. Yeah, I did yeah, jump, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, let's go from it. Uh, so yeah, I got 12. <sighs> and then, um, yeah, the guy that kicked the door, he was given eight years for manslaughter, doing half, didn't have to do four. Um, <sighs> yeah, and um, I think the main reason the main reason I was given the murder, I believe, is because I touched the knife. And, um, you know, that's one of my biggest regrets in life. Like, I shouldn't have picked up the knife. But in that moment, it was just like survival mode, you know? I, I didn't... It went from chasing guys in the park to knives and machete, like, samurai swords. And, like, it's one of my biggest regrets. But, like, I picked up the knife. I threw the knife. My prints were on the knife, you know. I didn't like really conceal the knife. I didn't wipe prints. I didn't like, it was just, 
it just happened so fast. I didn't, there was nothing, do you know what I mean? Like I just, it just happened so fast, picked up the knife and this is why I believe I was found guilty. Um, but you never used it, it seems yeah, like, unjust. What's, 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 so, what's so mad is like, there's other cases where like, you know, someone will kill someone and they've both got knives and um, people can get, you can get self-defense, you can get manslaughter, but like I literally got a murder sentence when I didn't stab anyone, I didn't even see the murder, I didn't even chase the, the guy that unfortunately lost his life. And it's like, yeah, it's just, it's crazy, it's, it's mad. And like sometimes I think about it and like, I've obviously I've moved on from it, I've accepted it, but like, sometimes it still does kind of haunt me in a sense like, I don't know how I made it through knowing that like I kind of got done over I kind of got do you know what I mean like I kind of like I, I always to this day feel like it was unjust do you know what I mean I didn't I met guys in prison that killed people got manslaughter they stabbed people nine times got manslaughter they did a, like they're doing a third of my sentence do you know what I mean they're doing it they're doing it four years I knew a guy that punched someone to death he got 18 no he got three years do 18 months I'm thinking, do you punch someone to death and got 18 months? I'm doing tw I'm doing a 12 year minimum before I can ask to be let out. Do you know what I mean? I'm not even guaranteed. So like, yeah, my prison, yeah, just like going through prison, it hasn't been easy. Like So you start out in juvenile prison. Yeah. What was that like going in there? Um, juvenile prison, I always explain, I always say this like juvenile prison is like it's like the most hostile prisons that I've been in. Um, everybody's quite young. Everybody's under 18. Um, I always say this, but I feel like in London prisons, people that are under 18 that go to prison, it's like everyone is just a gang member. Like everyone's a thug, everyone's a gang member. You don't really see other, you see burglars, you see carjackers, but pretty much everyone is a gang member. Everyone's from a postcode, everyone's got rivals. Um, and yeah, like, it was, it, I, had, I had a lot of like, I had a lot of, I saw a lot of fights. I had a lot of fights. The first prison I went to when I was found guilty, um, so this is going back before sentencing, sorry. This is like when I was found guilty at trial, but not sentenced in March, 2011. I was in a prison called Ashfield. Um, and this prison was a uh, private prison. It was in Bristol. And um, it was kind of good that I went to a private jail straight away. Private jails are very different to government jails. Um, you get a lot of privileges. They're run by like a security company called Circo. We had phones in our cells. Um, you had like quite a lot of channels. Um, some of the cells, you have showers in your cell. Um, that's for the privileged people, but... Like that's unheard of in, in normal prison, do you know what I mean? Um, so I went to Ashfield, I settled in. I was still kind of like trying to under, come to terms with the fact that I've been found guilty. Um, there, was, uh, there was an incident that I was involved in that led me to be shipped out. Uh, basically, there was like a fight on my wing. Um, it happened at the gate, fight on my wing, two guys are fighting. I think the officers were trying to stop it, but these two guys, they were quite, they were quite big guys. Officers were just helpless, couldn't really do much. And I remember like a set of keys. The keys are always attached like a chain. I don't know how, but the keys literally came off the chain and they just <laughs> flew past me. And I remember seeing the keys and I remember thinking, um, I had a, I actually had a visit that same day. I had a visit that same day and I knew, even though I was new to prison, I knew if the keys go missing, um, if the keys go missing, we'll be on something called lockdown. Um, but I saw the keys go, I had a friend, um, I don't know. He's crazy. He picked up the keys and like he started unlocking prisoners. Like so, there were some prisoners that were like locked up. So if you're locked up during association, you're like under punishment. You're do you've done something wrong. He was unlocking doors, um, just like letting people out, freeing people, literally freeing people up. And then he's thrown the keys. And then that's when I said, yeah, if the keys go missing, I'm not gonna get my visit. So I remember I literally I didn't even touch them with my hands. I remember I had like. Uh, uh, it was one of like a fleece I used the fleece I picked up the keys and I literally put it on top of like a phone box um, there was like a we have phones in our cells but there's like phone boxes on the landing I put it on top of a phone box and I thought I did, oh sorry sorry the keys got thrown on top of a phone box 
I've picked it off the phone box and I've put it on the on the table in the middle of the wing. Like I literally did it on camera in the middle of the wing. I've put it back so they find it. And then um, I think after like another five, 10 minutes, a lot of officers have responded to the incident. Everyone's locked up, everyone's locked away, cool. And I remember just being in my cell and I remember thinking like, it's lunch soon, we'll be let out. And like, I didn't hear no one being let out for a while, like for ages. It was just quite silent on the wing. Everyone's banging, what's what's going on? Where's the food? Where's the food? Where's the food? And then I remember like um, hearing like doors open, like a door will open, then it will close. Then the door will open, then it will close. Door will open, then it will close. I remember looking at the gap of my door, uh, looking at the crack and I'm looking down and I can see the officers, they're giving out food in packets, like opening, shh, closing it next door, shh. And then I'm thinking, they're feeding us behind our door. I'm still new to jail, so I'm naive. I don't really, I just thought, ah, right, cool, maybe the fight, no one's coming out. Cause usually we dine out, we eat, all eat out. And um, yeah, like they're opening doors. As I could hear the doors getting louder, I know they're on my landing now because I'm on the second floor. They're coming, like, they're coming. And I just remember my next door's door opened. They gave him food. And then as, I've, as I've, I'm waiting, they skipped my door. They've skipped my door. They've gone to my next door. I'm thinking, what's going on? Like, why have they skipped my door? I even pressed, there's a bell you can press to call officers. I pressed the bell. Nobody responded to the bell. The bell was just ringing. And I think like 10, 15 minutes later, I remember I just sat down and my door just flew open. My door just went whack. It hit the wall, bang. And then I've gone, oh shit. Like I thought, I'm not going to lie. I didn't know who it was, but I thought I was about to get beaten up. I just remember the door went whack. I've looked and then um, there was a guy, uh, he was stood behind a lot of officers. He was quite tall. He had a video camera, a camcorder. And he said, state your name and number. And, get to the, uh, and then he told me to get to the, and I said my name, my prison number. He said, get to the back of the cell. And literally these officers, they all came in, they had shields, they handcuffed me and like they've took me away. They've took me off the wing. And I was thinking like, I didn't, even, I swear I didn't even, I was thinking, it just happened so quick. I was like, I didn't even know what was going on. But I was a bit scared. Like I didn't really say what you lot doing, why I was just scared. They've took me to the segregation unit and um, I'm asking them like, what's going on? And then a governor came to me and he basically said, you touched some keys. Um, you're, you are now an escape risk. Um, and I remember they took my clothes, my prison clothes off me, and they left me with something called an E-man suit, which is like an escape suit. It's like, people call it like a jester's outfit because it's got like yellow and blue p colors, patches. And yeah, like they took, they even took my bedding, they took my clothes, they took my quilt, they took everything. They even took my cutlery because when you're on the E list, the E escape list, you are a potential escape threat. So you can make weapons or you can make keys out of anything. They took everything. I literally just had a blue mattress to lie on. And um, the next morning a bus came and I was taken to a prison. They told me you're going to Warren Hill. So literally like I just settled in in this jail for two months from March till May. And they're telling me, yeah, you're going to Warren Hill. And I knew Warren Hill wasn't a private jail. So I was thinking, oh my God, I've gone, I'm going from a luxury jail to a proper state jail. And I've gone to Warren Hill, I've gone to the um, the wing. Sorry, I've gone straight to the segregation actually. I'm still in my escape suit. And uh, they made me do a week down there. And then they told me after reviewing everything, they realized I'm not an escape threat. And they said to me, they'll give me a chance to go to like a long-termers wing. So to qualify for the long-termers wing, you have to be like a long-termer. I wasn't sentenced yet, but I was found guilty for murder. So they knew eventually I'm gonna be a long-termer. So I've gone to this long-termers wing. I was settled there settling in, meeting a few people and I was just getting into, I was just getting on with things, yeah. Just, um, Warren Hill showers. Yeah, cool. And then, um, all right, so I was on a course called Resolve, which is a violence course. Um, it's basically like an offending behavior program. It's like an eight week intense course. Prisoners will attend it, talk about violence, anger management, how we can resolve situations, how we can avoid using violence basically to like rehabilitate and like tick boxes. I was on a course with a few guys, got into an argument with a guy, I can't remember what it was over, got into an argument with him. I remember he, we were in a violence course, he stood up and he's like, do you want it? And then I've stood up and said, you thought, I do want it bruv. And then basically uh, the facilitators got in our way, they stopped it, nothing happened. Um, and then like, we didn't speak 
for a few days. Like we were told to like mediate there, shake hands. We done that. We didn't speak for a few days. We just used to see each other on the wing. We didn't say anything. But I remember on the third day, he said to me, can I borrow your Chris Brown CD? And I said to him, yeah, that's cool. And I was thinking, but then the fact that he asked me for a CD, I felt like, all right, that's cool. Like, we're cool. I've let him borrow it. So that was on like the third day. And I think like three days later, I remember being in the showers. I was on my own. Usually in prison, people go showers with their friends. Um, thinking about now, I think it's more for a safety thing. But sometimes it's just to have a, you know, just have entertainment. You just talk about girls and stuff in the showers, whatever. I've gone to the showers and I remember I'm coming out of the shower. Um, the shower cubicle has like a square. So it's like a shower door with a square in it. And in the square, you can like hang your towel, hang your boxes. But it's also like you can see through it. Um, as I'm like coming out the shower, I'm looking through. I can see the guy that I've had an argument with that's borrowed my CD. But like I say, we know we've spoke through the week. I've let him borrow my CD. I didn't really think anything of it. And um, I remember coming out of the shower, still like in my boxes, towel just in my hair, ruffling my hair. And I just remember like I just felt like a punch on the side of my face. He's punched me. And then when I've looked to see who it was, it was this guy that I had an argument with. And he literally said, what are you saying now? What are you saying now? And as soon as he's punched me, I literally just saw red. I literally just like, they weren't even like targeted well. They weren't even coordinated. I was just throwing my hands as fast as I can. I think I landed a few on his face. Um, all these mates were there as well, who kind of like, when they saw I was winning, they kind of like stopped it. They pulled me off him. And um, it got left at that. You know, he left. The next morning, uh, before Unlock, we was called into an office by the governor. And the governor basically said on camera, he's seen how... I've gone in, he's come in, he's come out. This morning he's gone to healthcare and his nose is like massive, do you know what I mean? His nose is like, he's got two black eyes. And they basically said like, we want you guys to leave it here or else you'd be kicked off the wing. And I've left it there. And like this time I felt like he's, we've resolved it, he's left it. But one thing that taught me was um, in prison, if you have an altercation with someone, you never know when it's over. You never know when it's over. And even if they say it's over, it doesn't mean it's over. You kind of always have to be on alert. And this happened like six months into my sentence. So that kind of taught me, sorry, not six months, four months into my sentence. So that kind of taught me, yeah, like you need to kind of be aware of what's going on. You, know? you need to be aware. So um, that was my first like fight in jail. And luckily it was just a punch. It could have been a, a stab. It could have been a cut, just a punch. Um, I think like a month later, I'm more settled onto the wing now. Um, one of the guys I hangs around with, um, he was a bit younger than us, he was 15. Um, he basically got, I don't know what it was over, he got beaten up in a, he got beaten up in a cell. I think he asked for extra food for the servery and they didn't like it. They beat him up in a cell. Came to me and my other friend, he was crying. He was like proper crying his eyes out because he was like 15. He's like, oh, they beat me up. He was all sniffling. And me and my friend said, I, we're gonna get these guys back, but we were like trying to plan it strategically because we knew this guy works in a servery and there was always like a little 15 minute window where after the officers leave, they're cleaning up on their own. So we planned it for a few days. And I think when we when the time was right, we ran in. Um, four of us ran in, but two guys that were with us, they didn't even do anything. Uh, we've two of us have ran in. We've seen this guy on a servery and I remember just seeing the shock on his face when we burst in. And literally we just started punching him, we just started punching him, kicking him, just throwing him around, just kicking his face, kicking him up, we beat him up. And then um, this all happened behind closed doors, but he's kind of like made such a commotion and such a scene. He came running out with his t-shirt ripped and all the officers saw him. They've pressed the bell. We've gone behind our door and they've put us away, put us away. And then literally a few hours later, same thing again. I'm being marched to the segregation all over again. And now, um, now it's like July, July 2011 and literally I'm down to segregation but my sentencing is next month and um, all these things that I'm doing, the key incident, the assault now, the fight in the showers, all these things are going on reports that are going to be given to the judge for my sentencing. So not only should I be keeping a squeaky clean record for sentencing, like not only did I not do the murder, like this could actually impact what I get from the judge but that's the kind of headspace I was in I was like so pissed and so angry and so upset with what had happened it's almost like I didn't care 
you know, I knew I'm going to be doing like 15 years in jail. So I just didn't care. And um, yeah, I did, I did some time down the block. I think I did like six weeks down there until my sentencing came. And um, I literally went to the Old Bailey again in August the 4th from the segregation in Warren Hill. Um, got my 12 years. And um, from getting my 12 years, I went to Felton Prison, HMP Felton. Um, the first night in Felton, I remember um, my TV didn't even have an aerial. I think Felton was one of the worst prisons I've been in. The TV didn't have an aerial, like, I just, that was poor. Like, and the woman literally came out with a pencil. She said, uh, we haven't got any aerials, but I've got a pencil. Do you know how to use a pencil? <laughs> and I said to her, I said to her, like, what do you mean? Like, how do you use a pencil? And um, she literally put the lead in the little hole, balanced the <laughs> pencil against the wall, and, and it worked. It, it did work, do you know what I mean? And I was thinking, wow, what kind of jail am I in? But I've heard of Felton, like, Everyone's told me felt I mean like the worst prison, like the worst, especially the side I was on, the juvenile side for violence, gang violence. It's the worst prison. Um, I think I did like a month or so there because because I was sentenced to twelve years. I'm I'm classed as a long termer. Uh felt I'm only hold short termers and people on remand. So I wasn't gonna stay in Feltham. I was gonna be moved on to a long termers prison. But in my stay of Feltham I saw so many fights. Like I saw, there was a guy. He was being escorted by an officer. I, I don't know where he was going, but basically, a wing was coming back from gym. Uh, in Feltham, you can't just walk around freely. Officers have to escort people at a, groups at a time because of so much fighting. Uh, unfortunately, this guy he had an issue with somebody on this wing. Uh, the gym I literally saw like 20 guys just all throw their shower kits to the side and run over and just kick this guy's head in literally just literally everyone just started kicking his guy's head in the officer was so scared the officer moved back they pressed the emergency bell but like just literally like 20, 15, 16 year olds all just kicking the shit out of this guy and like it was so volatile as I'm watching it I almost felt scared I almost felt like shit like are they gonna get me like I don't know these guys but it just it just looks so vicious that I was thinking are they gonna get me and um I remember like even the guys fighting a lot of them were hitting each other by accident because there's so many of them they're all throwing punches and kicks they're all kicking each other and um that's when I realized yeah yeah so prison yeah, it's not a joke like that guy that got attacked he didn't know he was getting attacked he could have been going to a visit he could have been going to like a legal phone call a legal visit and within a split second, a gym, a whole wing saw him and they just trampled all over his head. So those are little incidents when I saw them, I felt like, wow, like oh, prison, like prison, prison, prison is actually dangerous. Like, do you know what I mean? Officers are there to like press bells and stuff, but in a split second, things can kick off. And like I say, getting attacked by 20 guys, it's not nice. I didn't even... I couldn't even see the guy. That's how bad it was. I just saw feet, just feet, 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 just loads of feet. I couldn't see him. Like, I think, yeah. So that was what I saw in Feltham. Um, and then, yeah, I got moved on from Feltham. I ended up going to a prison called Weatherby. It's in Leeds. It's up north. Um, Weatherby was quite, quite different to me. The reason I say that, um, I saw guys from, like, loads of, like, it's up north. I'm used to London. I'm meeting guys from, like, Yorkshire. Newcastle, um, Birmingham now, Manchester. And um, it was cool. Like, I think everybody likes Londoners. <laughs> everybody li everybody listens to a lot of, like, rappers from London and stuff. So when I've gone there, like, yeah, everyone was all right, man. And then I've ended up going onto like, a long-term wing. Um, and I'm meeting guys that are doing life now. Do you know what I mean? So I've got guys I can relate to now. I've got guys in a similar position as me. And um, yeah, I was settled on there. I was settled on there. Did like a year in that jail. And then yeah, I've turned 18. Um, 18 now. So I've gone to a prison called Swimpton Hall. So uh, at the time, when you're 18, there's only three prisons that hold long term as 18 to 21. One was called Moorlands. That was up north, like around Yorkshire. Um, I didn't want to be up north anymore. It was hard for my family to visit. My family would visit me all the time, but it was quite hard for them to come up all the time. So I asked to be sent to a prison called Swinton Hall. There was another prison called Ellsbury, which I could have gone to, 
but I had two co-defendants in there and my probation wasn't allowing all of us to be in the same jail for obvious reasons, fighting and stuff. Because obviously it's like a gang case, gang related case. So I've ended up going to Swinton Hall. Um, one of my other co-defendants was in there at the time. Um, and yeah, Swinton Hall, it was a mad prison because this was a prison where um, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't separate sex offenders. Yeah. Yeah, so what? literally like, I've gone from being in all these tough jails, London jails, to a jail where there's like 50% of the jail are sex offenders. What? Yeah, and like the sex offenders aren't separated. And I couldn't get my head around the fact that like, the sex offenders had the best jobs. The sex offenders kind of like, the officers favoritized them. And like, they were safe in a way, like like they didn't get beaten up or anything. And I f- and like, it was just, it was, it was the mad, I'm not gonna lie, it was, it, it proper messed in my head, that prison. That's a shame they didn't get beaten up. Yeah, it, it proper messed in my head, like they, they like, oh, I don't know how to explain it, like the officers preferred them over us, do you know what I mean? The officers looked at them as like, you know, they've got mental health issues, they've been abused as children, oh. but like you guys in for murders and guns and knives, you guys are like the scum, oh. you guys are like the criminals, do you know what I mean? And like, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. So it was, a, it was, a, it was definitely a massive shock to me, Smith and Hall. And was the riot there? The riot, yeah. So, well, the the riot, it didn't actually start off as a riot. <laughs> it was, um, it's basically me and some of my friends who we were on a wing. So basically, Smith and Hall is like a Birmingham-based jail. It's in the West Midlands, but it's mainly like got Birmingham guys in there. It had London guys in there too, but like a Birmingham jail, it's in the West Midlands. And um, yeah, there was one evening, um, so there's like a servery, the servery are the people that are serving the food to the prisoners on the wing. Um, on the servery, there's five people, four out of five were from London on that servery. There was one guy from Birmingham, even though the jail was a Birmingham jail, the London is a, sorry, the wing is a Birmingham wing the four Londoners on there were all lifers. So because they'd been there for quite a long time, built a good rapport with staff, you know, they were given that job to, to, to do the job. There was one day where the Birmingham guy on that servery was telling the London guys, look after all the Birmingham guys, like give them more food. And I think, um, these are my friends on the servery, by the way, the London guys, they just, they, they just didn't do it. I don't know why they just didn't do it. And then uh, after servery, one of the guys on, uh, sorry one of the guys that wanted the food not the server someone that wanted extra food from Birmingham that didn't get it called one of my friends uh, to the cell and my friend was coming to the cell and as my friend was getting closer to the cell he said he noticed like a wire and he said when he looked he said he said the guy that called him had a kettle but he, he just noticed the plug socket and then he stepped back and he's like what are you doing and he's like come in the cell he basically was trying to hot water him throw hot water in his face and um, so they're arguing my friends come to me, but I'm locked up. So basically, uh, every other day, you come out every other day. So that day wasn't my side to be out on association. So I'm locked up. My friends come to me and he's like, yo, this guy just tried to hot water me. And I'm saying, no way. So I'm basically saying, All right, tomorrow, it's, it's basically going off tomorrow because right now I can't do anything and my friend's on his own. The next day, because my friend's on survey, by the way, he comes out every day. But the next day, my side come out. <sighs> my side come out so we were basically waiting to do it the next day from the morning we had exercise exercise is when you go outside to get fresh air from the morning these Birmingham guys were basically winding us up saying London guys are just rappers they're not serious like all they do is rap they don't do anything but I remember thinking now is not the time like now is not the time exercise it's got a lot of officers and we just wanted to do this at the end of the day. Now is not the time. And it took a lot because I could hear what was being said. And everyone on the wing knew what had happened the night before. So everyone was all like, you know, like everyone's gossiping. Oh shit, did you hear? Like there's a little tension between the Birmingham guys and the London guys. Tension, blah, blah, blah. And then um, literally, yeah, I went about my day. I went to education. Came back at lunchtime. Went to education again. We've come back at, uh, it's the evening time. It's, it's 6 p.m. now. 6 p.m. This is association. It was almost like 
it was all, it wasn't nothing was really planned, but we knew it's happening at Solsh. So as soon as our doors got unlocked, we've come straight out of our shower kits. We've gone straight into the shower, had our shower because we don't know when we're gonna get a shower again. This whatever's about to happen, we don't know where we're gonna end up. We've showered. I've jumped on the phone. I've rang my mum. Um, this was two days before my 21st birthday. So this was the 6th of August, 2015. I've rang my mum because I just knew this might be the last phone call. I didn't tell my mum what was about to happen. I didn't say anything. But mother's instinct, she knew that she knew something wasn't right. And she said, what's wrong? I didn't want to tell her what was wrong. She said, what's wrong? I didn't want to tell her what was wrong. I said, I'm all right. And then um, I've come off the phone. And then literally after this, after that moment, um, so in my group, there's about five of us. Um, the Birmingham boys, there's there's quite a lot of them. There's about 12 of them. So I remember like we said, yeah, cool. Everyone's showered. Everyone's had their phone call. Now we're going to do it in it. We've gone towards their end of the wing and they've all stood up and they've come towards us. And then before anything kind of really kicked off, one guy said, let's just talk it out. Let's just talk it out. Come, we don't need to, let's talk it out. Let's go in the, he said, let's go in the showers but the showers is near the office where the officers are. So we said, no, 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 let's go in there. So we've gone in a cell. I genuinely think this guy did not want to fight. I think he was trying to defuse it. Because when we've gone in the cell, like everyone's got their hands in their trousers. We've got our hands in our trousers. Everyone's moving a type of way. But um, he's talking like, let's talk it out, blah, blah, blah. I just heard a commotion outside. I remember stepping back out of the cell. I see one of my friends with a snooker cue and he's chasing another guy from Birmingham. But this Birmingham guy has got like a sock in his hand and in the sock is like something large. But my friend with the snooker cue's chasing him. As soon as this has happened, I remember it's all just kicked off. I've had like a plug in my hand. I've swung a plug. These guys, these Birmingham guys, they've all had knives. They're like swinging knives at us and then it's all spilled out onto the landing. I remember kicking someone, falling backwards and then literally like pool balls are going everywhere. So as this is all kicking off on association, Prisoners are just running for their lives. There's pool balls flying everywhere. Um, literally, like, we've chased this Birmingham group. They've started running again. We've chased them. One guy's tripped up. One of my guys have, like, kicked him. My guy with a pool cue still chasing the guy. It's just kicking off in different directions. But I remember literally just running, running, trying to fight these guys. But they're running. There's pool balls flying everywhere. And, like, for that moment, I just felt like Superman. I remember, like, there was pool balls flying towards me. And I managed to just dodge every single shot. Like, it was, like pool balls, there was like broken glass flying. And I remember just dodging everything, even kettles were being thrown. And I remember just dodging kettles and literally these guys retreated to the second floor and we were on the first floor now. And then um, it's crazy because this is a bit similar to like the case. And um, they were basically telling us to come upstairs. We're telling them to come downstairs. While all this is going on, the officers are just locking everyone up. Everyone behind your door, everyone behind your door, everyone behind your door. Everyone's being locked up behind their doors. Um. The bell's been pressed. All the wings in the prison have been locked away because it's like general alarm number three. All the officers, emergency assistants, all the officers in the prison have come to our wing. And these guys from Birmingham are still on the second floor. They've got kettles, they've got blades. And like they're basically telling us, come upstairs. And we're saying, come downstairs. And nobody's listening. The officers have got a, um, a megaphone. They're at the gate and they're telling us, last chance, come back to the wing. And uh, one of the guys I was with, he's doing like an 18 year sentence. He's a bit immature, he's a bit crazy. He threw a kettle that had like oh, boiling water. He threw it towards the officers and it missed them. They closed the door, they closed the gate and it missed them. But when they closed that gate, they left. And when they left, I remember looking at my friends like, oh, this has gone like, this is, this is, this is, this is mad now. Like they've left, they literally left the wing. And now it was just like a free for all, like as in there's no officers to kind of like mediate or referee the, the fight. And literally like, I'm not joking, yeah, for the next, f for the next four or five hours, yeah. It got to like, it got to a point where they were telling us to come up. We were telling them to come down. It got so boring. We just started doing our own thing. We just started chilling. We were chilling that. We got bored of like being out and literally like hours had passed, hours had passed. It got to midnight now. I remember around uh, 11 o'clock, we were on the news. I heard, yo, we're on the news. So we've gone to the cell disturbance at HMP Swinford Hall. We were on the news. I couldn't believe it. I was thinking, shit. And I was kind of thinking, well, like, 
I'm probably never getting out of jail now because, like, yeah, this has become a riot. Do you know what I mean? Like, it was meant to be a fight and it's become a riot because the officers are so, like, under threat. They couldn't contain it themselves. And then, um, yeah, it sounds mad, but, like, we were just playing music. We were smoking. We were chilling. And they were just in their piece of land. We were in our piece of land. And, like, we just... It got to a point where, like, we, we were talking to them. They were, like, talking to us, like... You lot are dickheads. They were like, you lot are never getting out of jail because we were all lifers as well. So we didn't have release dates. They're like, you lot are never getting out. They were laughing at us. And we were just laughing at them <laughs> because they got their heads kicked in. And literally like around midnight, I remember um, there was like a Tanoi intercom. Last chance, everyone behind your doors. We didn't listen. And I remember the gate flung open. And at the time I thought it was like deodorant cans. I saw like six deodorant can looking things fly sliding down the landing. And then uh, I did it, and as, as they were sliding, I realized, I, I don't know, I just started running and they were flashbangs. They were flashbangs. They literally flashbanged the wing. And as soon as they flashbanged the wing, my, it's white noise, shh, white noise. I ran in the cell. I remember being so scared. Like I just, and then uh, I remember jumping in the cell, jumping on my knees. And then all I could hear was barking. And literally they stormed the wing with dogs. Like there was like 10 dogs. They stormed the wing. And these lot were called nationals. So, the officers that were working shift at the time were like day officers. Nationals is when there's a disturbance or a riot in a prison and the, the best the best officers in the country are called. So like it was at midnight. So someone could have been at home with his kids, with his wife. He's going to be called as a riot. And because he's like grade two or grade three, it's like the strongest. It's like basically like if they're literally a level below the army. They said if I was told before, if nationals can't contain a prison, the army come with, with real firearms, do you know what I mean? So they had flashbangs, they had dogs, they had kitted up helmets, shields, everything. And they usually stormed the wing and that's when it all ended. And like, it was a relief because once again, it was a fight that got so out of hand, the officers left. <laughs> and I genuinely felt like during that six hours, like six hour altercation, I was fearing for my life once again. Like, do you know what I mean? Like some of those guys were bleeding, one of my friends actually nearly died. Um, they smashed the sink into pieces and they were throwing chunks. Remember, they're on the second floor. They're throwing chunks of ceramic sink at us, yeah? My friend managed to dodge a bit, dodge, dodge, dodge like a bit of the sink, but some of it like literally like cut his whole arm and like there was so much blood. Ooh. And I remember like when he's come in the cell, I remember just seeing blood just squirting. And like even that, like it made me feel sick, like the blood, because I've never seen blood squirt. It was squirting and like, I felt like, like that's what I'm saying. Like it was literally a reenactment of the case. Like I thought it was this, and it went to this. It just changed completely. And um, when these nationals stormed the wing and it ended, it was just I was just so relieved. I was like, it's over, man. It's actually over. Um, we were all locked in our cells. And then uh, I think half an hour later, literally my door opened again. Bam! Come with us. I was handcuffed. I thought I was going to the segregation. I was put straight on a bus. I was straight on a bus and I was taken straight to a prison called Brinsford. Um, straight to segregation again. Did about a week there. I located on normal wings. But um, if you remember, this was two days before my 21st. So Brinsford is a YOI. So I was too old to be there now because I'm 21. So I went to a prison called Hule. Um, they call it HMP Blake Nurse, HMP Hule. And that was the first adult prison I'd been in. And um, I'll be honest with you, like it made me feel quite nervous because <laughs> I've been in jail since I was 16. I've been with prisoners my age. I've never been in a prison with men. Like I saw men in their 40s, I saw men in their 50s and it made me feel quite vulnerable. I felt like, you know, like I can fight guys my age. I can say no to guys my age. How am I gonna say no to the 35 year old steroid head? Do you know what I mean? Like guys are massive with tattoos. And like, I'm not in London again, I'm up north in the Midlands. Um, but I just went with it. I went onto the wings. Uh, I refused a cellmate for quite a while. I've never had a cellmate before, but they were talking about, you have to have a cellmate. I refused a cellmate for ages. There was one night, it was like 9 p.m. My door was opened at 9 p.m. by an officer and I saw a guy in his 40s stood there with his bags. And I remember literally like, I almost felt like I was gonna cry I remember shouting, he's not coming in here. He's not coming in here. No way, he's not coming in here. And like the thought of sleeping in a room 
with a stranger, it just frightened me. Like, and then I remember the next day, I literally went around my whole wing. I was just trying to find who can I share a cell with that that I can accept. And I saw a new kid. Um, he was 21. My good friend, his name's Kieran. I saw him. He just come on the wing, and literally we shared cells. And um, yeah, we got on, man. We got on. And uh, Hugh was the first prison I ever got a phone in as well. There's a there's the first prison I'd been in where like I saw drugs like I'd never seen drugs in jail. I saw weed, I saw heroin, like I saw alcohol, I saw mobile phones, I saw smartphones, um, and literally like it was just a completely different. Yeah, so Huel was the first time I saw phones, um, the first time I had a phone, and um, I'm not gonna lie, it was like the first time where jail didn't seem as hard. Um, I could use phones, I could ring people, I could use smartphones. Um, I never smoked before. I'd seen weed, like cannabis, I'd smoked. I enjoyed it and it almost kind of took me away from prison. It wasn't, it felt like prison wasn't as hard as it used to be, sat in a cell doing nothing. Now I'm on a phone, I can literally be speaking to people all night. And um, yeah, it was, it's, uh, it was my first taste at adult prison. And I, I realised adult prison is a lot it's a lot more relaxed compared to like a child's prison. Um, so after Huel, um, I, I ended up moving on to a prison called HMB Dovegate. Um, Dovegate was another private prison. This was in Utoxa. Uh, it's like near Stoke. So I'm 21. I think I did about a year and a half in Dovegate. Um, Dovegate was another prison that was quite relaxed. A lot of phones, a lot of drugs. Um, there was an incident that happened when I was there. Uh, yeah, it was an incident. Basically, I was on a wing called P-Wing. Uh, P-Wing was the long-termers wing. It had people from 10 years to like 35 years. It had people doing massive sentences. You literally had to be 10 years and over to be on P-Wing. Um, and basically... When I was on P-Wing, there was a time where there was a guy, he cut, he cut a hole in, a, in the fence on the exercise yard. So in the prison, you have a perimeter wall and then you have like a metal fence just after the perimeter wall. He cut a hole in the fence and I'm not sure what he did exactly, but he managed to cut a hole in it and like put it back and it almost never looked like it had been tampered with. And basically the hole was just big enough for this guy to squeeze through and um, what was going on I didn't know at this point but basically they were arranging people to throw things over the perimeter wall land on the grass the hole in the fence someone would squeeze through it and collect these parcels and bring them back onto the wing Um, these parcels were like sports shakers full of tobacco full of weed full of spice and Within the weed, within the spice, there'll be like iPhones, um, Zankos. Zankos are like the little plastic phones. They'll literally be full of drugs, full of phones. And um, all this was going on during December 2016. And um, literally my wing, we were the long term wing, but we were like the wing that had literally everything. Like so many people had phones, so many people had drugs. And um, I think the things coming over the wall there was only three times it happened. On the third time, one of the parcels didn't make the grass and it smashed on the, the pavement. When it smashed on the pavement, as you can imagine, the shaker bottle is plastic. All the weed just scattered everywhere. All the phones just scattered everywhere. And um, we all knew, like, basically, because it was in an area where the guy couldn't reach, it's just a matter of time before, like, this whole operation just, just, just crumbled. Um... At this point, Christmas is coming up. So we had a good Christmas. That was the first Christmas I ever had in prison where like, it was like a party. It was like an all day party. You know, there was alcohol, there was drugs, there was music and we were literally partying all day. Um, And I think that weekend or the week after, we noticed that when they did perimeter checks, they found like a lot of, they basically found the parcel that never made it. They basically found a parcel that never made it and... um. Yeah, basically, it all just came. It all just came undone. Um, there was a Tuesday morning where we were put in lockdown, and basically, like we were all locked down on the wing, 
and one by one everybody's cell was getting like smashed open everyone's cells were getting like searched everyone was getting strip searched um and at the time i was short for money um i made a silly decision i agreed to keep a lot of like contraband within my cell um i wasn't known for drugs i wasn't on the radar so i felt like yeah you know i've been offered a lot of money let me just keep this stuff here and um i didn't even see any money because like i think a few days after keeping the things in my cell um you know as you as you can imagine the things were caught i was caught with the things i was taken to the segregation once again um i did a few weeks down there and i was literally shipped out straight to liverpool prison um liverpool prison now i'm back up north you know being from london i'm being sent back up north i'm in liverpool jail um you know, I felt like a foreigner. The culture was completely different. And uh, for like the first time in my sentence, I'd say like I felt quite alone. Um, I didn't know anyone there. Didn't have anyone from London there. Um, no, like there wasn't really, there wasn't any black people up there, to be honest. Like even when I was in Leeds or Birmingham prisons, there was like different cultures. Going to Liverpool, there was literally no black people. Um I was told to be careful being black up Liverpool. I didn't really face any racism myself, but I wasn't used to an environment where like I was the only like, you know, black person up there. So it was quite different for me. Um I remember I got into an altercation as well in Liverpool. Um this was over a milk on the servery. I was on the servery, a guy wanted a milk. Um I just didn't like the way he asked for the milk. He asked quite aggressively and he said, like, get some milk. And I remember saying to him, like, don't talk to me like that. And he basically said, what? Do, do you know who I am, lad? Do you know who I am? And I said, like, listen, don't chat to me like that. I didn't, I didn't even care who he was. Don't chat to me like that. And I remember I've served the wing. I've gone back to my cell. Uh, my cellmate at the time, he was a laundry. He was, does the laundry. So a lot of people are in and out of our room asking for their clothes. Um, two guys have come in. I didn't recognize them, but I didn't really take notice because I just assumed they were coming for their clothes or asking my cellmate for clothes. Um, and I remember the first guy, he was quite large, ginger. He just said to me, what was you saying to our kid? And like before I even had time to register what he'd said, he literally just like uppercutted me, just chin shot me straight away. And I remember like when he's hit me, I was thinking like a sudden thought of, wow, like he's hit me, it'd be crazy. And then I remember when I first moved into that cell, my cellmate had like a table that was like flat packed in the corner. And like, as soon as he's hit me, my instant reaction, I remember I saw the table, like I've grabbed it and I've started whack. I've tried to swing it at him. I didn't realize at the time, but that punch kind of dazed me because cause I'm fast, I'm athletic, I'm strong. As I'm swinging his table, like it's not really hitting him. It's not really, I felt like, am I slow? Is he fast? I didn't understand why is it not connecting? It connected with him a few times, but the second guy he was with, as he was kind of moving towards me, I noticed like he had a blade in his hand and this cell now I'm locked. Like they closed, cause they've come in and they've locked the door. There's two of them, my cellmates in the corner. He's like in his forties. I don't really expect him to get involved. He's like, he's a grown man. And literally as soon as I saw the knife, as soon as I saw the blade, my heart just started like, it just started rushing as far, like so fast. And I remember just thinking, I, I got to like fight my way out of this or else I'm going to die. So literally like, it kind of gave me like an adrenaline boost. I remember I'm swinging the table leg like, even as fast as I could. And like the guy is hitting him a few times. He's, he's going like that, he's hitting him. And in the end, the guy with the knife, he's opened the door and he's ran out. The guy's ran out as well. And I've chased these guys off. And literally that was like the first week of me being on that wing. And um, it was weird because a lot of people weren't speaking to me when I first moved to the wing. But after that incident, I gained popularity and a lot of people kind of respected me for it. The guy with a knife, um, he ran out my cell with a knife in his hand. So when the officers saw this commotion, he went down to the segregation. I didn't see him again. The guy that punched me, we mediated, but I found out the guy that I argued with over the milk, he'd paid these guys. I also found out the guy that punched me, he's known for like knocking people out of one punch. When he's punched me, he didn't knock me out. <laughs> so. I think a lot of people respected me for that. Um, in the end, I squashed, uh, I basically, me. I felt, I can't lie, my pride was hurt, but I ended up, you know, resolving it with him. I squashed it with him because I also knew I'm in a jail up north. Like, 
or I beat this guy up and go to another wing and then get into issues everywhere. So I kind of left it at that. And I think the fact that everyone said, yo, like you chased them off, like you're 22, you've chased them off, like you've done your thing. Everyone respected me. So I was kind of satisfied with that and I left it at that. And literally I did like 11 months in that jail, did 11 months, I got my cat C. Um, I got my cat C, but on the, uh, on the build up to my cat C, the riot um, came back. Yeah, so the riot that happened in 2015 came back and um, I ended up going to court. I ended up going to court, Stafford Crown Court. I pled guilty to a fray. I was sentenced to about 20 months. Yeah, so I didn't get extra time, but I had to, it was running alongside my life sentence. So yeah, that happened. I pled guilty. So I got a new charge of a fray and then I got my cat C, went to a prison called Stoke Heath. Um... I did about two years in Stoke Heath. Did about two years in Stoke Heath. Um, there was some debt collection. Yeah, two years in Stoke Heath. So when I was in Stoke Heath, this is like 2017, the end. Um, and I stayed there till about the end of 2019. So with this whole joint enterprise law, the law was actually abolished in 2016. The law was thrown out. The law was publicized to be unjust and unfair. And... Um, I was basically in the process of trying to sort out my appeal and like it kind of gave me hope again that you know what like they've actually accepted that the law is wrong you know there's a chance I might be able to go home on appeal and um yeah when I was in Stoke Heath you know I was um I was like selling I was selling like I was selling vapes I was selling tobacco I was trying to like I was just hustling wheeling and dealing and um in 2018 I got the final letter from the solicitors to say at this point, we can't take on your appeal because the bar was set too high. So between 2016 and 2018, I'm believing I'm going home. I'm believing, you know, the truth, the truth will set you free. Like, you know, I can go home. Then I was told um, the bar was set too high and basically like, I'm sorry, we can't do anything about it. So this kind of sent me, it put me in a mad headspace once again. And um, I felt like, all the people that owed me like money for vapes, <laughs> for tobacco, I was literally just beating everyone up. I felt like I went through like a mad depression where I just wanted to take my anger out on people. And like, I got into a lot of fights again over small things, ended up in a segregation again. Then I got placed on a new wing. I was settled again. And um, basically I was settled again. And um, yeah, I remember on my wing, there was like a massive, there was a massive, like a massive race war. Um, it wasn't really like a race war but um, the wing was quite segregated there was the black guys there was the white guys there was the Asian guys there was the Albanians and um, there was one night where someone shouted out their window um, someone shouted like the n-word like shouted it out their windows but it was a Scouse accent it was like a Liverpool accent and um, I remember the next day all the black guys were like yo we're just gonna go down there and just smash everyone up literally and um at that point in time where my appeal had gone out the window the headspace i was in i just didn't care i thought yeah i'm just gonna get involved you know we're just gonna batter everyone no one knew who said it nobody owned up but i think everyone on the ones who was from manchester and liverpool they were all just gonna get beaten up um when i was out during lunch the so senior officer he pulled me into the office because he had to um upgrade me from basic to standard I was on basic because I'd like broken a window. So basic was like a punishment. He was going to upgrade me. So as he was upgrading me, a massive fight kicked off on the second floor, which I was meant to go to, but I missed it luckily. And um, literally by the time we got there, there's a big commotion. All the officers have got there. By the time I'd got there, literally like it just, it just looked, everyone has been smashed in. There was like blood everywhere. The, co the cameras were covered and like all the black guys literally just smashed everyone up on that floor. Um, even people that weren't involved got beaten up because nobody owned up to saying the N-word. And um, the aftermath of that, all the black guys were segregated off and shipped out and I was left on my own. Um, and I just carried on with my sentence as it is. And um, 2019, I didn't, um, I didn't get my parole. Yeah, I didn't get my parole. Um, there was a video that I released. Um, I was freestyling from my cell. And... Um, 
Yeah, I didn't get my parole, man. It didn't even it didn't even make it to paper. It didn't even make it to paper. Um I put the order wrong, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I put the order wrong. It's all right. So wait, 2019, 2019, I didn't get my parole and um I was shipped out of the prison now and I've gone to another jail called the Mount. And then um so 2019, due to my behaviour, the fighting, things like that, the debt collecting, I didn't get my parole. And this parole was for open prison. This parole was for my open prison and I didn't get it. So I had to basically go for my open prison at the end of my sentence. So I was sentenced to 12 years HMP, a life sentence. Three years before the end, you can apply for open prison and go to an open jail where you can go get a job. You can slowly reintegrate back into society. Um, my chance to go for that was taken away from me and um, yeah due to my behaviour so then I was shipped out to another prison called HMP The Mount um, this was quite closer to London not as close to London this was another jail I'd gone to now I'm in my last three years of my sentence um, and I'm applying for something called exceptional circumstances where I'm trying to go home um, due to good behaviour so I'm behaving I'm behaving I'm behaving I got caught with some phones. I got caught twice with two iPhones. Luckily, due to like technicalities, they were thrown out, but they were delaying my process, delaying my process for my parole. Um, then eventually I lost my parole again. Um, it just, COVID had come. So the excuse was COVID, but around this time I'd released like a video that had went viral from my prison cell. Um, I'd covered my face, I was rapping, but um, <laughs> For some reason, they just knew it was me. Officers knew it was me. <laughs> they came to me on the wing. They were like, we know it's you. You know, like, you need to be careful what you're doing. I had a good rapport with the officers, so I wasn't punished by them. But when it came to the parole process again, once again, my parole was taken away from me. And um, I was told later on that apparently it was because they couldn't actually sanction me for the video because they couldn't prove it was me. But they swept my parole away from me due to the video. And... Um, it was a weird one because like that most people would have stopped doing videos but I had such a passion for music and like it was my way of getting my story out like now I'm doing podcasts but then I used to make music and put my pain my experience into music and um, the reaction I got from the first video who um, was on it was on actually on Delinquent Nation yeah and, yeah <laughs> it was on Dimitri's channel Delinquent Nation shout so, out Delinquent yeah shout him out so that was getting mad views. It was getting a lot of views. And like for the first time in my life, I felt like people are actually taking to me. People are like <laughs> listening to my music. People are feeling my emotions. And I just carried on making music, literally carrying on uploading videos. So I was basically like risking my freedom because I was enjoying the fact that like my music was like making noise. You know what I mean? And I kind of like enjoyed the feeling. Um, yeah, 2021. I've got a year left now till I go home. So 2021, I kind of stopped doing these music videos. This was my last year in prison. Oh, sorry. 2022 was my final year in prison. Oh, sorry. So yeah. So 2022 is my last year in prison now. Um, I stopped making these videos as my parole is coming up. But this time I'm going for release. I'm not going for uh, open prison. Most lifers, you have to do three years in an open prison before you're released due to like being institutionalized for so long. Um, it's just for like mental health reasons you're meant to be like drip fed your freedom rather than just being pushed out the gates um, so 2002 I just stopped doing videos I stopped using phones and I was literally just getting on with my sentence and then I had to sit a parole um, because of COVID uh, the parole people hadn't didn't come into the jail it was done over like video link um, and it was on a big screen and uh, literally like three people on the panel and I basically had to like plead my case to them why um, I should be allowed to go home. And um, they literally went through everything, like from the start of time, from my childhood, my involvement in the streets, my mentality, my behavior in prison, um, what I'm gonna do when I get out, my attitudes, um, just literally went through everything. And like, it was like, a, it was a long process. It took six hours. And I remember I wrote a statement and like, I remember explaining to the parole board, like for so long in my sentence, I'd struggled to like cope because I'd always like been so angry and upset with the system. I'd always blame the system. 
and said like you guys have convicted me of a murder I hadn't done but then I think it took years of like maturity to realise like I had to take more responsibility for my actions and like it's almost like I was ignoring the fact that somebody had died and like I had to literally sit with it and understand like I went along with guys I went along to have a fight I went along to like act a certain way and unfortunately somebody lost their life over this and I remember when I was speaking to the parole about this I remember like I just I just started crying like I remember like I'd never actually said it to people before and like I had to even like pause my parole I came back it was like I just like it was it just it just hit me like it was almost like the first time I'd said it into existence like I had to like actually take some sort of responsibility you know I might not be a murderer but I went along to something where someone lost their life and like the pain it's caused my family, I couldn't even imagine the pain it caused the victim's family, do you know what I mean? So I was I had to show remorse, like I still show remorse. And um, yeah, it was just, it was a mad process. There's a lot of emotions and literally like it took months, but um, they finally like granted me my parole. Did they know about all the things you'd done in prison that were bad things? The bad th- yeah, they knew about They knew every, about all like, that? All the fights, yeah, but because it was so years back mm. it wasn't like i'd shown maturity i'd shown a change mm. i'd shown like even like with the riot thing that happened in 2015 and i'm going for parole in 20 2022 so it's like seven years later do you know what i mean so did, did they know about the rap videos i actually I, I don't know i don't know they never mentioned it but I, I, i'm not too sure i'm not too sure i think that was more of a we can't prove it's you so we it can't we can't really stick it on you kind of thing we can't justify it but but yeah, I just literally like, um, yeah, just I've had a lot of ups and downs in my sentence. I've had good times, I've had bad times. I did a lot of mentoring throughout my sentence because I used to go to a good school. I had good grades. I had A levels. I just did a lot of mentoring throughout my sentence. Um, I was a drugs mentor. I used to help people with addiction. Um, but with my mentoring, I was more education mentor, and I teach people, help people. Um, I was almost like the LSA, like a teaching assistant. And um, all these things just like helped me for my parole. And yeah, like I proved to them that um, I was ready for release. I was fit for release. And I think aside from all of this, they took into consideration that like I didn't actually kill anyone. Do you know what I mean? They sit many parole boards of people that have done double murders, shootings. And they've just, I'm the 15 year old kid that got done for a joint enterprise. Do you know what I mean? So I felt like they were quite lenient towards me as well. And yeah, it was a long process, but um. I sat my parole in October. I didn't get released till the 29th of December, 2022. Did you have gate fever? Like being scared to get out? I wasn't scared to get out because I felt like I didn't know what I was getting out to. It sounds weird, but there were instances where like, I used to have outbursts, like anger outbursts. And like, I think it was because I know I'm going home and I just didn't have a date. I didn't have a date. They never give me a date for ages. And like, everyone was like, you're going home, relax. But they don't understand. Like, I've been waiting for this day, like my whole life. And you're not giving me a day. You're just telling me you are going home. But I didn't know when. And it was starting to like mess with my head. It's nothing worse than the uncertainty. Yeah, it was starting to mess with my head, literally. And um, yeah, I finally got my date and I had to wait another month for it. Like, I think I got my date like end of November. Then I went home the end of December and yeah, I came out, came out to my family, my mum, my dad and my brother. And it's just an amazing feeling. Oh, what was that yeah, like? You know, it was an amazing feeling, man. I remember like hugging my mum, my mum was crying as usual. <laughs> oh. I was like holding back my tears and um, I just knew like I'm never coming back to jail. Do you know what I mean? I'm never coming back. Like I did so long, I lost so much of my life. Like I, I can't ever come back to this place. I can't ever come back like and um, like even since I've been out, I've realized like being in prison, you're so like, you're just put away. Nothing's going on. Like you're kicking off about not being let out for association. You're kicking off about food not food not coming to you correctly. Like, do you know what I mean? Like there's things that don't mean anything in there. They mean so much. And like now I'm in the real world. I think like, I can't believe like, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I, survived 12 years in there <laughs> knowing that I didn't even do the murder do you know what I mean so 
yeah so it's a lot of like a lot of reflecting to be honest like since I've been out I don't really think about prison but I just know like I don't ever want to go back to prison and like since I've been out I'm trying to build things I'm trying to you know I'm trying to change my I'm not changing my life I'm trying to create things for my life I'm trying to build things in my life and I feel like if I go back to prison I'm just going back to zero so yeah, that's one thing. I'll, I'll definitely never be going back to prison. Yeah. Even though it was unjust, do you mm-hmm. feel that prison kind of helped you mature and shaped you and strengthened you? Yeah, I feel like it's un- it was unjust, but the person I am today, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the person I am today. If that makes sense, and um, that's why I feel like with my message, with what I've been through, I have a duty to like speak to people you know like with my public speaking like speaking at schools going into prison speaking with kids um so like i've been booked in a few times at secondary schools in london i've done talks with like year 10s and year 11s Um, i've done like workshops i've delivered like creative writing um storytelling and like i even go into prisons and i do like i basically like tell people my story and tell, like, I want people to relate and say, look, I've been there too, but like, I'm out now. I've done a life sentence and I've changed my life because I feel like when you're in prison, you're kind of made to believe that you'll never be, you'll never be amount to anything. You'll never amount to anything. And like the system will make you feel like you can never do anything special in your life because you have a criminal record. So when people see me and what I'm doing, like with the public speaking or like, even like um, there's, t- I've done podcasts with MPs or on joint enterprise, I've done like uh, radio interviews with like lawyers um, and like I'm still out here trying to like fight the law, get the law abolished or get the law at least reviewed Um, because there are some cases where joint enterprise is justified but I just believe in cases like mine it it isn't justified, do you know what I mean? And I feel like there needs to be a review where you know, you can't be giving me the same sentence as someone, do you know what I mean? As someone that's done it. So I'm still out here trying to like fight and get like some sort of justice. Um, I'm with a campaign called Jengba. Um, stands for Joint Enterprise, Not Guilty by Association. Um, I've done a lot with them. Like we go to we go to do like, you know, like rallies, we go to do protests, we go to like different meetings, podcasts, events, and we just like kind of spread the awareness to Joint Enterprise and we want people to kind of be aware that this is a law that's being used uh, quite unfairly and it's just to raise awareness and kind of deter the youth from like hanging around with bad company. So um, yeah, even though it was a harsh sentence, I kind of like, I'm happy with who I am now and I'm happy with my mentality. And um, yeah, I just feel like I'm, I am the voice, I'm the voice of joint enterprise and I need to, I need to get out there, yeah. Good for you, man, you're on a mission. So there's a theory that mm-hmm. when you put people under the most pressure, mm-hmm. that produces the best art, the best music, the best mm-hmm. writing. Yeah. Do you think you're a case of that? Yeah, definitely. Because um, I didn't do music. I didn't write music till I went to prison. I like I had friends that used to rap and sing, but it wasn't my thing. And um, with me, music was like my therapy. Like I didn't one day go, I'm gonna write music. Um, I just think like. I was just stressed and instead of writing like a journal I just found it more exciting trying to like rhyme how I was feeling and literally that's how it all started and like it sounds mad but like when I was in prison I felt like my music was better it's <laughs> raw isn't it, it then? Raw, yeah, yeah because I was going through it like and I'm so used to writing raw sad emotions and I don't feel like that anymore <laughs> do you know what I mean so like I'm trying to find a shift and still writing good music but like I started writing raw painful sad music and now I don't feel like that I I feel happy I feel different emotions so I'm trying to shift that energy into my new emotions now but yeah definitely I felt like yeah when I was in there it was deep I was writing deep music yeah and for people watching this where can they find Mm -hmm. your music um so on YouTube if you just type in cliche my music will come up I'm on like Spotify Apple Music SoundCloud, yeah, I'm, every, I'm I'm pretty much on everywhere. For yeah. people listening on audio platforms, um, do you want to spell that for them? Cause oh, cliche. <laughs> Yo, yeah, sorry, yeah. So, um, C-L-E-E-S-H-A-Y, cliche. 
because for people watching on YouTube, we'll have all of Cliche's links in mm -hmm. the description box below this video. And with your campaign then, can the public mm -hmm. help you with your campaign for Joint yeah. Enterprise? So at the moment, um, so Labour has just won government. Uh, we have a lot of Labour MPs that support. Uh, we have Jeremy Corbyn, we have um, Kim Johnson, uh, we have David Lammy. And um, yeah, so now Labour's in power, we are... We haven't got like a sp we haven't got like an exact plan of how we're gonna do it, but we now have a party that's in power with a with a few MPs that are very like against joint enterprise and they want to get it abolished as well. So um, you know, if petitions were to come up, it would help if people could help us like sign petitions. Um, but anyone that's looking to look into it a bit more, literally J uh, J E N G B A. It's called Jengba which stands for Joint Enterprise Not Guilty By Association. Um, if you just type in Jengba on Google, you will see it. Um, they also have Instagram as well, TikTok as well. But um, yeah, there's like a movement going on. And um, it's literally made up of a lot of mothers, a lot of wives, a lot of people, loved ones of the victims of Joint Enterprise. Yeah. So, um, so we'll put all your links and all those links mm -hmm. in the description box on yeah. YouTube. Maybe. If people, they can message you on Instagram directly. Mm -hmm. And if they want to get involved in this. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. That's oh. my story. All right. So, like I said at the beginning, you're a fantastic storyteller. You've made my job easy. I've just sat here listening, which is perfect. I, I like that long journey. Mm -hmm. um, for the people who've been on this journey with us for three hours, do you have anything to say to them in conclusion? And for the young people who may be tempted into the gang lifestyle as well? So, um, yeah, I just want to, like... Um, so I feel like what happened to me was very unjust. It was very unfair. Um, it's very unfortunate that someone has lost their life. And I always, you know, when I speak to my mother, we always pay our respects. And I always do take into account that someone has lost their life. Um, so even though what has happened to me is very unfortunate, I do genuinely believe that this was meant to happen to me in a sense that I didn't fold under pressure. Um, it happened to me. I've took it. I've matured from it. I've grown stronger from it. And I refuse to be silent about it. And um, I just want to speak to like a lot of the youth. With a lot of the work I do now, going into schools, going into youth clubs, I just want to show the youth the reality of like this gang life. It's like when you go to prison, no one's going to be there for you. Um, you know, your friends are your friends until you get a life sentence. Your friends are your friends till you're in prison doing a long time. And um, I feel like a lot of this stuff is like, it's done for show, but when it comes down to it, it's not, it doesn't really have any meaning. A lot of people in gangs don't really know why they're in gangs. I didn't know what I was hanging around with these guys for. I was young, I was naive. But, um, you know, you can end up in serious situations where you're looking at a long time or you're forced to basically you know, kind of tell the police what your friend has done. So a message to the youth, I just want people to know you need to really know the company you're keeping. You need to be careful who you're around. And um, just because you believe you're not doing something, it's not you that's gonna get in trouble. With joint enterprise, you know, you can literally find yourself serving a similar sentence or the same sentence as someone that has committed a crime. So. I just want everybody listening, not just the youth, but I just want everybody listening to this podcast. I want everyone to just take away the fact that, you know, you must be mindful of who you're hanging around with and you really need to be careful um, with what you're doing, what you're putting out, what energy you're putting out into the universe. Yeah, I mean, cliche was a good kid, grammar school, athlete, good parents, and it's just glamorized, isn't it? The gang mm. lifestyle, anyone yeah. can fall into it. Yeah, which is a shame because a lot of prick like social media doesn't I suppose it doesn't help you know a lot of kids see glamorous things and they think that's the way forward and then next thing you know they're too deep in it yeah yeah all right so all the cliches links are in the description box please support his work it's invaluable and let us know in the comments what you think about this video and give us a hug man brilliant well done <laughs> If you're looking for a gift, my new book, Sit Downs with Gangsters, is available worldwide on Amazon. We've interviewed over a thousand people now, and we selected 10 
of the hardest hitting stories to go in this book. Each chapter features the story of one of our podcast guests. Those stories are Shane Taylor, Knife Maniac's Redemption, John Elite, Mafia Hitman for the Gambino Crime Family, Joey Barnett, 35 years in UK prison, Ian Blink McDonald, £6 million bank robber, Chet Sandu, Asian smuggler in Spanish Supermax, John Lawson, the hit team commander, David Macmillan, international smuggler's Thai death row prison escape, John Abbott, San Quentin prison shootout and escape, Michael Francis, Colombo crime family capo portrayed in Goodfellas. And Wildman, English enforcer in Arizona prison. Link in description box on YouTube, available worldwide on Amazon. Also, my next book, Untouchable Jimmy Savile, is getting published in December 2023. So check that out as well. It will be available worldwide on Amazon. Thank you for listening. Cheers.